So here we are uh, resuming our public portion and uh, hearing portion of our Board of Behavioral Science. Uh, today is November 5th, 1149. My name is Max Disposti. I'm a board uh, chair for the Behavioral Sciences and our judge is right here with us and uh, Zoom in the proceedings for today. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Mr. Disposti. Um, uh, and I'll just remind everyone again, if you've just more recently joined us, we're doing our, uh, our petition slightly out of order um, to accommodate some logistical concerns. And so our next petition we'll be hearing today is uh, Ms. Chapman's uh, petition. Ms. Chapman, are you, um, can you hear me well? Yes, I can, Your Honor. Thank you so much. And I can see and hear you great. And uh, Ms. Litz, are you ready for us to go on the record? It, I see a thumbs up, so perfect. All right. We are on the record before the Board of Behavioral Sciences, Department of Consumer Affairs for the state of California. We're here to review um, next the petition for modification of probation filed by Shala Johnson Chapman. This is LMFT 112173, and the OAH case number is 20201003. Uh, my name is Wim Van Royen. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings for the state of California, and I've been assigned to preside over this matter today. Today's date is November 5th, 2020. Um, the hearings have been noticed for 8.30 a.m. It's approximately 11.51 a.m. presently. We are conducting this matter via Zoom video conference due to the COVID-19 public health crisis and the governor's executive order N-25-20 dated March 12, 2020. Um, and I will let the record reflect that at the start of our meeting today, we did have a roll call of all of the board members and that we do have a quorum of the board present uh, for purposes of conducting uh, the petition hearing today. May I please have a formal appearance by the deputy attorney general. Anahita Crawford, Deputy Attorney General. And good morning to you again, Ms. Crawford. Good morning. And good morning. And then uh, for the petitioner. Good morning, Your Honor. This is Shayla, Shayla Chapman. Good morning to you, Ms. Chapman. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your, your first name. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and so uh, I, in terms of just the procedures, we'll, we'll follow today. First, uh, the Deputy Attorney General will uh, proceed to uh, provide us with an orientation regarding the background and procedural history of this case, and then we'll introduce the petition packet. Uh, and after that, uh, Ms. Chapman, you will have the right to make a presentation under oath to explain why you believe the petition should be granted. You're also welcome to have other witnesses testify on your behalf, and yourself and any of those witnesses would be subject to questioning by both the Deputy Attorney General and the board members. Um, again, the board today is primarily concerned with rehabilitative efforts that you may have been engaged in and your conduct since you were placed on probation. Um, the board has had the benefit of reading the petition package and so it's not necessary for you to repeat everything that's included in it, but you can certainly highlight or emphasize any portions that you deem appropriate. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the purpose is not to relitigate the underlying issues, uh, although we'll briefly touch on those just so we have the background. Main focus is on your conduct since you've been on probation. Um, after the hearing, the board will go into a closed session to deliberate. Um, you won't receive a decision today, but you will receive a written decision in the mail at some point in the future. Um, do you have any questions I can address before we start um, the substance of our hearing, Ms. Chapman? I do not, Your Honor. All right, thank you so much. Then I'll turn it over to Ms. Crawford to um, introduce us to the background and procedural history of the case and introduce the petition packet. Thank you. Anahita Crawford, Deputy Attorney General, appearing on behalf of the Attorney General's Office, pursuant to Code Section 11522. I am here to assist the panel in fact finding. My role is not adversarial, but intended to protect the public interest. By way of a background of this case, the petitioner was issued her licensed marriage and family therapist license on March 11, 2019. The statement of issues was filed on July 6, 2015, which alleged 
that the petitioner was convicted of a DUI. In 2011, the petitioner was ordered to complete a first offender program and 49 hours of community service. Her probation was revoked in January 2012 because she failed to complete community service. However, it was reinstated with an order that she complete that service. But in May 2012, her criminal probation was again revoked for failure to complete community service. She was ordered to serve four days in jail in lieu of completing that service. However, she failed to report to jail to turn herself in, which resulted in her probation being revoked a third time and a bench warrant issued for her arrest. In 2015, she was also convicted of a DUI and also of driving on a suspended license. She admitted the additional allegations that she had suffered a prior DUI conviction within the last 10 years and that her blood alcohol level was above 0.15% in that it was a 0.18. She was ordered to participate in the 18 month multiple offender alcohol program However, in February 2015, the court revoked her criminal probation for failure to report to the offender program. Her probation was again reinstated on the same terms and was set to expire in January 2020. On January 15th of 2016, a stipulated settlement became effective, issuing petitioner her licensed marriage and family therapist license and placing it on probation for five years. In addition to the standard terms and conditions, she was ordered to undergo a psychological evaluation and psychotherapy, engage in a relapse prevention and dependency support program, abstain from substances and submit to testing. On August 27th, 2018, a petition to revoke probation was filed charging petitioner with failing to comply with the recommendations of the psychological evaluation by failing to take education courses in alcohol and substance abuse. She also tested positive for alcohol on February 8, 2018 and February 13, 2018. She failed to call in for, testing, for the testing program on 52 separate occasions between April 17, 2016 and July 10, 2018. She also allowed her registration to lapse while on probation. On June 5, 2019, another stipulated settlement became effective, giving petitioner one additional year of probation on the same terms and conditions. Petitioner's probation was told for six months in 2019, during which time she did not have to comply with the probation terms. One year and nine months remain on petitioner's probation. Petitioner is not compliant with testing requirements as she has been non-compliant from April 25th, 2016 through April 22nd, 2020. She is requesting modification of her probation as follows. To reduce biological fluid testing to one time a month, to reduce psychotherapy to one time a month, reduce supervised practice to one time a month, and reduce dependency support groups to one time a week. I can introduce our uh, petition, our exhibits at this time, Your Honor. Yes, certainly. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. Go ahead. Thank you. Exhibit one is the memo to the board members regarding petitioner's probation status. I would like that marked and introduced at this time. Any objection to exhibit one? You might have to unmute yourself, Ms. Chapman. I just want to make no. sure you don't have objections. So no objections? No objections. All right, exhibit one is admitted. Exhibit two is a notification of hearing to the petitioner of today's hearing date that we'd like marked and introduced. Any objection to exhibit two? No, Your Honor. Exhibit two is admitted. Exhibit three is a certification of license history for the petitioner. We'd like that marked and admitted. Any objection to exhibit three? No. Exhibit three is admitted. Exhibit four is the petition for early termination or modification of probation and the attachments in support. We'd like that marked and admitted at this time. 
Any objection to exhibit four? No. Exhibit four is admitted. And exhibit five contains the stipulated settlement and disciplinary order and the petition to revoke probation in case number 2002-018-001847. It also contains the stipulated settlement and disciplinary order and the, uh, and the underlying statement of issues in case number 2002-015-000761. We'd like that marked and introduced. Any objection to admission of Exhibit 5? No. Exhibit 5 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. I do not have any additional information to present to the board today. Thank you so much, Ms. Crawford. All right, so uh, Chapman, now is your opportunity to present your case. Um, uh, is it your desire to testify under oath today? Yes. All right, then I'm gonna have you just raise your right hand wherever you are and I'll swear you in. Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you so much. And um, because you are not represented by an attorney, um, I will just allow you to testify freely um, and provide us with whatever information and testimony you believe is relevant in support of your petition. Again, uh, if you were listening to the other petition hearings, I'm sorry to repeat it. You, you don't necessarily need to repeat everything that's in your petition, but you can highlight or emphasize anything you wanna further explain or elaborate on. Um, and then once you finish your testimony, um, Ms. Crawford may have some questions for you and the board members may have questions for you. Um, and so uh, that's the order we'll take it in. Um, if any question you get asked is confusing or um, not unclear, just let us know and we can get the question rephrased. If you do answer a question, we will assume you understood it. Fair enough? Yes, sir. All right, thank you so much. Then uh, you have the floor whenever you're ready. Okay, um, I have a written statement that I would like to read. Um, I've timed myself, it takes about like nine minutes. So just kind of a heads up. Um, <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to hear my story and review my request for modification of probation. I would like to start off by stating that although the process of being on probation with the board has been extremely challenging, I'm grateful for its intervention in my life. I wholeheartedly believe that without this intervention, I would not be sober today and would not enjoy the life I have right now. I was born in Wichita, Kansas, to a Persian immigrant mother and German Irish father. At the time of my birth, my parents struggled with financial and marital difficulties, which led to their decision to send me to live with close family friends as surrogate parents, a few hours away from their home. Although I was told that this decision was meant to be temporary, it ended up lasting for the first eight years or so of my life. I ended up referring to these people as grandma and grandpa and had a very strong relationship with them growing up in a home, in their home, where I felt loved and cared for. I ended up moving back in with my family full time around the age of nine or 10 and was happy to be living with my parents, sisters and brother. The transition moving back to my biological family went generally well and as smooth as could be expected. Fast forward a few years and my family and I had all moved to California to be closer to my sister. I started springboard diving as a hobby when we moved to California and loved it from the start. I graduated high school with honors, had a solid group of social support and earned a diving athletic scholarship to the University of California at Irvine. It was during my college years that my relationship with alcohol began and I developed an eating disorder. I have always remembered putting pressure on myself from a young age in whatever I was doing, whether it was performing in school, performing at diving meets, or being a good girl at home. I remember hearing a loud voice from a young age in my head telling me to be better, get better grades, be better looking, work harder, and the list goes on. 
I'm fairly confident that one of the impacts of my early life circumstance of living with people who weren't actually my parents was that I developed a fear of abandonment and a highly critical inner voice. I placed a lot of pressure on myself to perform well, both academically and athletically my first year of college. I found that my inner critic wasn't as loud after having alcohol and drinking at parties. Even though on the outside, it appeared I was only a social college drinker, just like the majority of our other students I was around, I quickly realized that alcohol had began to serve other purposes in my life without my awareness. It helped numb me when in emotional pain, it made me feel more confident, less anxious, and tricked me into thinking that alcohol was what I needed in order to truly live in the moment. There were a couple other factors worth noting that I believe played a role in the relationship to alcohol and the two DUIs. Growing up, my father was a police officer and his role in law enforcement has always been a big part of his identity for which he and our family has been proud. Although I'm not proud to admit it, there were multiple incidences from a young age when I was a young girl where my dad being a police officer prevented natural consequences from actually occurring. For example, I have vivid memories of my mother being pulled over for a speeding or another traffic violation and not actually getting a ticket after telling the officer her husband was a police officer himself. I also remember my older sister and I shopping with my mom one day and all of a sudden being walked to the back room with security because my sister had been caught stealing something. Within a couple of hours, our dad showed up, flashed his badge, and before we knew it, we were on our way home. My sister didn't have any legal consequences or natural consequences that day from shoplifting. The reason I feel this is important to bring up is because I think I felt for quite some time that I was somehow above the law or that if something had happened to me, there was always a way to get out of it or avoid responsibility. Now I understand this is not the case and have more respect for the law than ever before. Being on probation for the past five years has taught me that rules and laws exist for a reason that public safety is something to truly respect and care about, that all my actions, no matter how long, have natural consequences, and that above all, I'm just like every other person and I'm expected to conduct myself in a safe and responsible manner. The final factor I believe that played a role in my alcoholism was ultimately the untimely death of my 18-year-old younger brother, Joshua, when I was age 20. His death completely shocked and broke apart our family for many years to come. I had experienced depression and anxiety before then, but after his death, the depression got worse and I simply didn't have the coping tools or emotional resources to manage it on my own. Although on the outside, it seemed that I had it all together, I was suffering in silence and used his death for years to come as an excuse to abuse alcohol. I continued to place pressure on myself to achieve academically while pursuing a master's and then a doctorate degree in psychology. Although this helped give me some focus, something to focus on during this time, I also used school as a way to avoid fully processing the loss of my brother. And just like in college, when I felt insecure, anxious, sad, or overwhelmed, I knew alcohol could numb those feelings and effectively kept me from having to learn ways to cope with those feelings. I worked with a sponsor and a therapist regularly for a few years after my brother's death. And although it was helpful in me processing this loss, I was still drinking on occasion, which prevented me from needing to learn and use coping skills on a regular basis. It wasn't until my second DUI that I truly came to terms with my alcoholism and developed what I call my internal moral compass that guides me and keeps me in line with my core values today. 
The second DUI really terrified me and I will never forget how lucky I am to not have injured anyone else or myself. I have consistently used the lessons from the experiences as a driving force behind all the work I've done in AA and personal therapy. At the beginning of this process about five years ago, I must admit, I did not fully understand what exactly I was signing up for, but I am happy I have followed through with the commitment. Even though I haven't been perfect, I have consistently been able to rely on my coping skills and learn to ask for help instead of struggling alone. I have faced many challenges while on probation. However, I have been able to utilize the support in AA to help me navigate the long and difficult court process with the DUI case. The things I am proud of today are not the things I would have anticipated being able to say a few years ago. My whole life, I had a habit of referencing external achievements as a way to measure my self-worth. But today, I can honestly say that I'm proud of my character and the ways that I have dealt with these stressors I've faced the past few years. Becoming a mom 19 months ago was really challenging, was a very challenging transition for me. And I'm grateful that I had the tools and coping skills to help me navigate this postpartum period. I was fearful that my changing body during pregnancy would trigger eating disorder behaviors. I was also fearful that having a child myself might trigger any unresolved resentment or abandonment issues with my parents from my past. I am incredibly grateful that neither of those things, two things happened and I have utilized coping skills and community resources to support my postpartum health. I also believe that neither of those two things happening is a testament to the personal work I had done and had continued to do in therapy. My husband and I are expecting our second child now, and I'm confident that I will again turn to my community and support system during the postpartum period and in the near future. This process of being on probation with the board has given me the gift of being in consistent therapy while being sober. I have made more progress in therapy in five years than I had made in the 10 years prior. I have learned how to deal with life on life's terms. I've learned specific tools that work for me in the moment. I've learned that I can count on myself to show up honestly and transparently in whatever role that happens to be at the time, either as a mom, as a therapist, or as a wife. And know today that I don't need anything outside of myself like alcohol to manage. I have developed a level of self-acceptance that in the past I had only dreamed of. I have developed a strong sense of responsibility for not only myself, but also the public and my community. Becoming a mom in 2019 helped me more fully understand and see that it is in my best interest to protect the public. The public includes people like my sisters, my family, my son's swim instructor, his pediatrician, and someday his teacher. I guess that this is just a long-winded way of saying I have internal motivation for protecting the public. In 2019, I started a private practice twice a week. Although I have many years of substance abuse experience, the population I currently serve includes individuals and couples. I work with mostly mood disorders and relationship issues. My practice is guided by the biopsychosocial model and mindfulness principles. In addition to engaging in required weekly supervision, I have been attending monthly consultation groups with the other therapists in my office. I have always had great relationships with my supervisors, have received positive feedback about my professionalism, ways I handle potential ethical issues, counter-transference, and triggering sessions. Although weekly supervision has been helpful, my caseload is light and will remain this way for some time. And for these reasons, I would like to respectfully request a reduction in the frequency of these sessions. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my case. Now I'm welcome. Thank you so much, Ms. Chapman. Um, next, I'm gonna have, ask Ms. Crawford if she has any questions for you, all right? Uh, Ms. Crawford, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Just one moment. No problem. Ms. Chapman, are you still on uh, criminal probation? I am not. I was able to obtain early release of any informal um, probation for my criminal case. Okay, when did that end? That ended over two years ago. Okay. The exact date I do not have in, in front of me. No, that's fine, but sometime in 2018. Is that right? I believe so, if not earlier, but okay. yes, I believe so. Okay. Do you consider yourself um, an alcoholic? Yes, I do. Do you have a sobriety date? I do. July 20th, 2015. What is the significance of that date? That date is the day that I fully surrendered to the AA program. And it was, I think, a day after being released um, from my couple day stint in jail and the last day that I ingested alcohol. The prior day, sorry. Did, you, did your um, alcohol use ever lead to substance abuse? No. And today, how do you maintain your sobriety? I'm sorry, just to clarify, you mean substances other than alcohol? Yes. Yes, no. Okay. Um, and how do you maintain your sobriety? Um, there's quite a few things I do to maintain my sobriety. Attending meetings is a big part of it. I was working with the sponsor for uh, about three years. We went through all of the steps together. I keep myself accountable in my family, with my community. I developed coping skills to help me emotionally deal with things when they become stressful and um, practice these things on a regular daily, if more not uh, weekly, more, more like daily basis that um, keep me aware of things that used to cause me to drink um, that I'm aware of today and work on diligently in my life. There's a whole self-care aspect to it. I don't know if you want me to go into detail about that, but. Um, I, I do, please. Yeah. Um, I would say my, my self-care practices are a big part of how I keep myself sober. Um, that includes meal planning, talking to women in my community, which includes my AA peers, but um, also other moms that I joined when I joined a mom's group. Um, my self-care also includes certain medication management for mental health, um, keeping anxiety and depression in check. And my medication regimen has been pretty successful for the past um, few years, I would say. Asking for help and support when I need it. Um, and that tends to be on a more regular basis, not as needed usually on a regular basis. I'm, I'm constantly asking for support and help in a lot of ways. Um, I was reaching out to more uh, alcoholics more before I became a mom. That's like the service work isn't as much of what I do right now, but um, being active in my community, transparent, honest with them, open with them, communicating with them, not isolating is a big part of it. In addition to exercise, I've developed 
um, a more regular exercise routine habit that's been very, very helpful in maintaining my emotional and mental health, which is all under the umbrella of my sobriety. Why are you asking for your modification terms, uh, or excuse me, your probation terms to be modified? Yeah. Um, so a big part of my personal journey is kind of dealing with things head on. There was a lot of avoidance in my um, early recovery, avoidance of doing things on time, avoidance of um, completing certain things. And it was encouraged by my supervisor and my therapist. That I address the board person to person, even though we're on Zoom, um, because it was a big fear of mine. And I think I had an opportunity in 2019 to, but it was something I was really scared of. And I've really tried to have been working on the pattern of avoiding dealing with natural consequences and things that I had to kind of deal with and make amends with in my sobriety. Um, there are logistical things, concerns with it being extremely expensive and with my growing family, you know, would like to have the extra money and time for my family, but I, I realize that that's not the board's um, concern. And I also feel like I have, I know that I've been given frequent, regular, consistent, positive feedback from people who are working with me on a regular basis, weekly basis, that see my character, see my work, and feel that the level of um, frequency that I'm, I'm needing to speak with them is um, no longer necessary at that weekly level. Um, I, I guess I've always been taught that when working with clients, we try to initially surround them with as much support as possible. And then as they get healthier and develop skills on their own to slowly reduce the level of, of care instead of just kind of like overnight going from everything to nothing. So this feels like a, a natural um, next step for me is um, being ready to, to have that lower level of care in terms of reduced frequency. But I mean, one thing I, I think worth mentioning is that my record for a long time, I had this, um, like my, my, my license, my, my driver's license. I think I had a habit of maybe getting like a speeding ticket a year for, for quite some time. And that ended about five years ago. I haven't had any issues with the law. And, and the reason I feel like that's important is because even something is some people might think as minor as a speeding ticket um, would, would come up for me. That's, that's a big deal for me nowadays. And I, I don't want to have any, mm, how do I say it? Like I, under, I understand that driving above the speed limit is, is dangerous. And, and that's the reason I don't speed. It's not because I'm trying to avoid a speeding ticket, which used to be the reason a few years ago, if that makes sense. Um, there were a lot of external motivating factors that originally triggered me to accept my alcoholism and maintain in the program and my sobriety. But I've also, I guess I feel like I've kind of internalized the board and there are my, 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 myself, my internal reasons for wanting to keep my community safe, wanting to keep a clean record, wanting to think about people outside of myself and their well-being. when um, five or more years ago, it was really just kind of about myself. I don't know. Now I think I'm rambling, but hopefully that answers. No, thank you. Um, but I kind of along those notes, I, I do want to ask, you have a demonstrated history of not complying with probation requirements, um, both criminal and disciplinary. 
So why should your probation terms be modified when up until April, you were continuing to be non-compliant? Yeah, um, good question. I'm not sure what happened in April. That seems very recent. Um, can you, I, I, we can get to that in a second, but just to kind of put into context um, some of the violations, not that these are excuses, but I guess to at a big picture. Um, with the criminal probation, I think I was definitely still in my alcoholism and, and alcoholic way of thinking and, and avoiding. Um, I would appear in court for multiple, for my cases. And even though maybe I had missed the prior court case or hadn't fully completed my community service, even though I had made progress on it, the pattern had shown that essentially, okay, we understand, we'll give you an extension, try again type of thing. Um, so I, I took advantage of that, I think. And um, not, no, I'm not proud of that, but I think I was continuing to avoid a lot of the things I needed to deal with. With disciplinary action with the board, again, these aren't excuses. I just want to put into context. The first two years of my probation, the, the board was using the company Famatech for testing. And the first seven months of probation, I had never once been called to test on a Saturday or Sunday on a weekend. Um, and I think I just internally developed this habit of eventually not logging in on, on the weekends to, to test, um, to see if I had been selected to test. And other than a letter saying, you forgot to test, you forgot to check in on these dates. I don't think I understood the severity of those actions. Um, so I, I didn't, I thought, okay, this is, you know, I understand. I don't, I never get, I never get selected to test on the weekend. So those 52, uh, most of those dates were on weekend dates. The first two years I had been um, on probation when the, they changed the company to a new one. Um, there was the positive alcohol test problem issue and I had taken, again, these are not excuses. It was written in the very long letter that I signed saying I read it and understood everything not to take over the counter um, medications. And I had started taking a, a few days a week over the course of a few months uh, when I was sick, NyQuil. But when I wasn't sick, I had I needed ZQuil um, at times to sleep. And again, and not an excuse at all. I shouldn't have been taking any of those things the prior years, but I had taken them before on when we were testing with Famatec and never had a positive test. So I was alarmed and surprised when I received that notice um, that I had tested positive. It was two tests, I believe, in, in the span of a couple of weeks. And I was sick, but um, since then I have been really, really vigilant about not taking anything and making sure that I'm not, again, not taking any over-the-counter medications. So um, I just wanted to touch on those instances of, oh, and then the issue of, it said it was I was non-compliant with attending remediation education. Actually, what had happened is I did attend it. I did complete it. I did fine. I submitted a non-official transcript by the deadline date and then received notification that it wasn't an official transcript and showing proof that I had done that. And that was the additional um, violation. So not that those things are um, not things to be concerned about or question about, but I do think putting it in the context of um, the, 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 what happened is, is important. I, and I continued to um, show that I, I was wanting to be on probation and continuing to practice. Um, I think if, if my heart wasn't there, I would have just decided, you know, I'll pass on this for now. And if in a few years, you know, I could try again without all of these um, guidelines and, and restrictions.
Uh, Anahita, you need to unmute. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, my question was, if the board uh, decides not to not to modify your probation term, how would that impact your practice or your life? Um, it would just be a, a little upsetting, but I don't think, well, I mean, I don't think it would impact my life in any, it would make things really expensive um, financially uh until i'm eligible again to appear in the board with in front of the board um it would just and professionally in my practice um i i engage in supervision weekly i don't think it would affect um, my practice although this experience has really helped me become more aware of kind of clients' experiences, developing empathy for where they're at in their own stage of change um, and making monumental changes in their life. Um, but in terms of my conduct on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it, it wouldn't change things. Okay. And what have you learned um, while you've been on probation that will assist you in um, not having a repeat of what brought you to the board's attention? Yeah. Um, I certainly never want to let myself down again the way that I did back then. Um, I knew it would be tough. <laughs> to hear you present all the facts in my case at the beginning, but um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I had asked um, what you've learned on probation that would assist you in not repeating what is alleged in um, oh, yeah. the accusation. Yes. Um, yes, I've learned that I don't want to let myself down again in, in that way. Um, I learned that I care more about um, public safety than I, I knew. I've, I've developed. I've, I don't think at the beginning of this, of this entire process five years ago, I, I truly gave it as much thought as I needed to. And now I'm, I'm proud of the level of thought that I give um, my public and my community and their safety. Being on probation has taught me that I'm an alcoholic um, because it wasn't until the threat of, not even the threat actually, I wasn't able to practice for about a year, but not like having the opportunity to be in this field was a real, like was a reality for me that made me realize that's not the trajectory I wanted my life to continue to go. Um, the person I was while I, when I started on probation, I would say is not the person I am today. Um, being on probation has taught me that I can grow um, despite challenges and despite natural consequences, I can live a life that I'm accountable for um, and proud of. Um, being on probation has taught me originally, I think that I'm, I'm in charge of kind of the direction that my life goes, um, and I'm responsible for it. And with that responsibility comes some stress, but I, I feel like I'm proud of how I, I've managed it, um, more recently. Um, I think that's, that's, that's about it. I mean, I'm sure could probably talk, but. Thank you, I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. All right, I'm gonna to turn to the board members and I'll start. Ms. Foster, do you have any questions for Ms. Chapman? Thank you. 
to your honor. Um, as always, Ms. Crawford has the right questions. So as a public member in looking out for the interests of our public, I, I just wanted to thank her for giving us all the opportunities to hear the story. And uh, Mr. Chapman, well, congratulations to your new coming. <laughs> um, thank you for uh, guiding us through this journey because I, I, I understand, I can see it's painful and not easy. And, you know, I hope that no matter what the outcome will be, that this is also an opportunity to, for some people it's been a healing process, right? To be able to actually uh, put aside the, the stigma and the, the challenges that comes with the convictions and perhaps facing, you know, what we read and, and see. Um, so now, thank you. Reality, there are not particular questions. I was just a little, a little, um, I was, uh, in your uh, modification, you point out some of the possible, obviously, uh, conditions that will benefit you in relation to timing and you know and all the efforts that I can see you're putting into this but um, so your therapeutical support that you uh, describe also in your petition so how do you um, how are you willing to um, use that space that you are proposing to be diminished in a relations to your modification how would you and why so you know it seems like it's working really well for you right I, I mean it's doing the job they're supposed to be doing. So um, we understand the, the challenges of having terms in place and how they affect your life. But at the same time, you, you, you seem to understand also the reason why they are there. So if you can elaborate a little bit more on that aspect of emotional support and, and how it will come about if we decide to change. Yeah. Um, my emotional support includes my AA support women in my meetings. Um, certainly my therapy with Dr. Verman, which has been very helpful. Has been, um, has been extremely supportive in, in this process as well. And my family, um, I've been, part of my personal work has been to be transparent and address these things, work through shame. And so, you know, everyone in my family knows I have a hearing today and um, part of my emotional support and work is leaning on my, my family when I need it and asking for their support when I need it. Um, and sp more specifically, if that means, um, taking care of my son so that I can have like a more self care day to myself or needing more time for myself. I, I'm accustomed to doing that and comfortable doing that now. Um, so I, I hope that that helps answer your 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 question. My emotional, what how how would I continue emotionally supporting myself? And then the second part was, um, were you asking what I would do with my time, my a little bit of extra time that I had if I if my terms were reduced? Well, uh, well that too. I thank you. Um, no, mostly I was looking into. It seems like this support around you is working so well for you, even the. The terms that we put in place, and I know you are a year and a half from. Yes. Age, right, yeah. more or less. Yeah. Um, so obviously, it will come the time when you will be off probation, and yeah. uh, so it just like uh, you know, it seems like you really embraced the work and you're doing your progress. So um, you know, pulling that out or you know, reducing those support around you, not just emotional, but actual deprivation terms. Yeah. So um, I, I was wondering how it was going to work with you. I, I know you asked for a reduction of testing. Which yeah. Just to be clear, I would continue in personal therapy. Um, okay. I That's think, I think right now between the, I, I could see myself needing it maybe more on a weekly basis. Um, when I have my second child that I know that that's a more challenging time. Um, I think right now I would benefit more from maybe twice a month, once a month, um, is things aren't coming up as much in, in personal therapy. My supervision has been helpful. Um, but I think I mentioned my caseload is, is pretty light. And I also, I would continue to do the supervision if, you know, the terms were obviously reduced, we're not eliminating it, but, um, I would continue to do engage in the monthly consultation groups with my other colleagues in my, in my office. 
Um, so that would still be there. Um, AA, definitely I would continue to go at a minimum of once a week. Um, right now it's three times a week. So the level of, of testing as well, I would be continuing to test um, at random. And the, the change really would be major, fi mostly financial. Um, right now it's about a thousand dollars a month for me to continue these specific terms. So even just having the extra wouldn't really be extra, but you know, the 500 a month versus right. a thousand would be extremely helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you for taking the time. I'm actually have no further questions, your honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ehrlich, do you have questions for Ms. Chapman? Sorry about that, just the wrong button. Uh, hi, Ms. Chapman, how are you doing today? Hi, good, thanks. Um, I do have just a couple questions and I know that you uh, briefly touched on on some of the things that I, I wanted to find out about. Um, you talked about, you, you talked about that, uh, you, you mentioned that when you'd missed a test um, you'd get a letter. Were you, were you notified somehow after you missed a test? Um, when I missed log, if I miss a test, which hadn't happened, I think recently, but yes, I would definitely receive a letter. But if I missed logging in, um, from the weekends, mm -hmm. it would like weeks would go by, um, from, from my recollection where I would then receive a letter, um, okay. So, so at, at some point, at some point, we, I was I was notified. Absolutely, yes, um, yes, I was. And so I'm looking, I'm looking at the the dates of the failed, you know, login for the yeah. test. And, you know, it ranges from basically April 2016 up to July 2018. So about two years. Um, wouldn't it be fair, would it be fair to say that you must have received like a number of letters, right? I mean, so I guess my question is, you know, after receiving, let's just say the first letter, let's say two or three letters, why wasn't this changed? Why didn't you, you know, start checking in on weekends? Yeah, um, that's a fair question, certainly. And I, I think because I had got accustomed to this pattern where when things would happen, like receiving a letter, again, I don't think I understood the severity, like what exactly it means to be on probation with your licensing board, but to like receiving a letter saying you didn't do this and then being like the next week or the next day continuing as usual, I, I guess it just kind of reinforced this behavior of like, well, that I, I need to get better at that, but the world's not going to end if I don't do something about it now. Um, well, you, you were on probation in your criminal case, correct? In both cases? Not the, um, in, in that time? Uh, no, prior to that, just prior when, when you had your criminal cases, you were placed on probation, right? Informal probation, correct. Probation. Yeah, and, and during that time, I was, I was doing a lot of the court required 18 month program, ankle bracelet, drug patch, all of that. And then in your 2015 case, was that, or there was at some point a violation of probation, was there not? My, my, there, there was, yeah, I had not um, so the completed community. terms on time. Yes. Um, I think that I read that because of that violation, that they had you do some amount of jail time. I think they it was. Did, yes. Okay. So, I suppose my question is in response to, you know, your response about, hey, I got these letters in the mail from this test. I didn't really think there was much, you know, in terms of um, consequences about it. Was your experience with your court cases and the violations and ultimately be, being put in jail that did that, you know, sort of help you? I mean, how, how did that not help you understand that there are consequences for not yeah. following probation? Um, going to jail certainly was like one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had. So that definitely helped 
me understand that. I wish that would have happened a long time ago. Um, and once I think I fully accepted and came to terms with the fact that like this needed the probation and following all the terms needed to be part of my, like the main priority in my life, I really did make efforts at changing them and including everything from having my husband, you know, have an alarm on his phone in addition to having an alarm on my phone on the weekends, having post-its on my walls, um, writing things on my hands. It wasn't good enough. And I can say like during that time, I think I, I, I had a lot of other things that I was doing and trying to accomplish. Looking back, I would have done it differently. I definitely would have not, you know, even though I probably, like I got married in 2018. I was planning a wedding. I was finishing my doctorate degree. And although those things gave me some motivation to continue like in this field and, and try to find some joy in my life and create happiness in my life while I was going through all this stuff, it impeded my ability to really prioritize the probation terms. And I think understand that like how, like how um, important and serious it was. So I, I definitely was kind of like distracting myself, I think with all the things that were, you know, I was, I was doing in my life and looking back that was a mistake. I'm sure my compliance with probation would have been a lot better if I didn't quite have so many things going on. I understand. Um... I was wondering if you could explain why the probation was told. Um, yes, uh, my probation was told for maternity leave. Um, I believe it was told for about six months. So a little bit before the birth of my son, a few weeks, a couple weeks. And then before I um, went back to work. Okay. And then is there, well, let's see here. Um, and then you're, you're saying that the, the cause for the, the positive tests were a result of like using cold, cold medicine, cold medicine, um, on one occasion. And then the other occasion, it was just alcohol that was in z -Quil. Um, I did not know that it on fine, fine print said 10% alcohol, um, on it until the, like I, I received the notice that I had tested positive. Okay. Okay, well, I'm, those are all my questions. So thank you for being here today and for being so candid with your testimony. All right, thank you, Mr. Ehrlich. And then let's see who's next. Uh, Ms. Friedman, do you have any questions? I do, can you hear me? I can hear you well. Okay, because I wasn't sure what, I thought I was unmuted. Um, Thank you so much for being here. You've had a very difficult journey, it sounds like. And you did mention that you had so many distractions at some point, which caused you to fail to follow through on many of the requirements of probation. There is nothing like two children to be distracted. I can tell you personally, two is like two million. And it is a lot of work. So have you thought about how you could do all what you have to do to maintain what you really want to maintain with two children? Yes, um, I definitely believe that I, this is something I've thought about. And I would say that it, you know, it has been really challenging but very rewarding um, with my son now, he's 19 months old. Um, I would say that my life has slowed down significantly since um, I became a mom and in a good way. Um, I only practice two days a week um, as a therapist and am committed to maintaining a certain cap on my caseload and, and keeping those two days the same, um, regular, maintaining that um, practice, I, I, I see in the foreseeable future, at least the next three years, probably. Um, if I need to go down to once a week, that's something I'm totally comfortable doing. 
Um, I asked myself that same question when my son was originally born and, you know, continuing to do therapy and joining a mom's group, stroller strides, those were the things that really helped me and my AA meetings. Like those were the things that helped me balance my life. Um, the self-care practices I have today are things that help me deal with the stressors when my son is, is, is stressing me out or I become really tired. Um, or overwhelmed, which I'm sure is, you know, only going to get more intense with the second one. But I've, I feel like for myself, I've really been able to prove that I've utilized my support systems around me that I've, I've created. And it, it's just, it's not, it's a habit, but it's part of me. I've internalized the practices that I need to engage in on a regular um on a regular basis, including a lot of mindfulness practices um, that keep me grounded. And I mean, even just before today, I, I started, I, I did a meditation on my, um, my phone, this app called Insight Timer. I've really found like breathing exercises and guided meditations to be very helpful. Um, so, you know, body scans, progressive meal, uh, muscle relaxation, so I do think I'm aware of how challenging it's going to be. Um, and again, I think just how I've handled it the first time I, I, I was, I was proud of myself and confident that that's how I will continue to handle it with the, with the second one, setting really clear limits on myself and having boundaries about how many people I'll be seeing in, in practice, how much I'll be working um, so that I don't overextend myself. Well, it isn't so much the practice as it is what you're going to do to follow through to keep yourself safe. Yes, definitely. And all those things, again, on, you know, everything from meal planning um, for my family to routine exercise is, is part of my weekly, like, structure for myself. Um, I've carved out a lot of time for myself um, and, and making sure I'm aware of, you know, therapy and mom group and AA meetings. And it, it feels like it's at times excessive, but important that, you know, I, I have those things in place to, to help me. Um, Cause I, you know, I can't do it alone. And, and my family has been a big part of that, that support too. They're both, they're local. Um, I have family here and my in-laws are here all within 10 minutes and they've been a tremendous support. So I'm grateful to have um, them in my corner as well. That sounds really good. Good luck. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Friedman. And then um, Ms. Herwick, do you have any questions? I do. Thank you. I, I think you answered the couple of questions I have, but I did want clarification on one. I, I think that I heard you you say that you did have another three years. Are you currently working with that sponsor now? You cut out just a little bit. I'm oh, sorry. Was the yeah, question no. I have a sponsor? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Judge Van Royen. I want to make sure because I think our court reporter probably did not catch that. Is that right? I did. Yeah, I did not catch what she said. And then um, the petitioner asked her to repeat it. So I yeah. think, yes. I think I'm yes. it now. Yes. Why don't <laughs> you re ask the question if you don't mind, Ms. Herwick? That way the record's clear. Thank you so much. Hopefully. You me. I, I was asking for clarification. I heard you say that you did have a sponsor for three years. I'm wondering if you're dealing with a sponsor in AA. Yes. Um, my sponsor, Janice, moved away about 22 months ago. Um, but during, like we did the steps before then, but no, I have not gotten another sponsor yet. Um, my understanding of kind of the role that sponsors play and that she played was they really help you manage cravings and triggers and are kind of a sounding board if you feel like you can't trust yourself or keep yourself accountable. Um, although it's not the exact same when talking about these other people, but talking to a therapist once a week, having supervision once a week, going to AA meetings three times a week, talking to women in my support group, like I feel like I'm doing that a lot, um, talking about 
me and, and kind of my internal process. And I, I haven't dealt with um, triggers and cravings. I mean, it's not like I never think about it, but um, I don't struggle in the sense that like I, like I was the first couple of years where I was really like, I, I needed to call her and talk things out. Um, I, I feel like I have a very long list of people I, I do do that with on a regular basis. So I guess a sponsor at this time feels, would feel maybe a little redundant, but I'm not opposed to um, starting with at the sponsor again, if I, if I need, feel like it, it's necessary in the future at any time. Thank you. No other questions. All right, and let's see. Next, we have um, Mr. Maddox. Any questions? I think I just have a couple. Thank you for coming today, Ms. Chapman. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm curious, um, and I guess my questions are along the same the lines of um, Board Member Ehrlich. I'm very curious about how you were able to, I guess, for lack of a better term, sort of convince yourself. Um, that you weren't required to do certain things, whether it was show up, to show up to the program or check in on the weekends, even though one, you had agreed to do it. And then two, there were sort of ongoing reminders that, hey, you're not complying. Um, I'm wondering what you've learned about one, why you know that happened? And then what supports do you have in place to ensure that that sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, entitlement doesn't raise its head again? And if it does, how you could, um, manage that. So the first question is, you know, what have you learned about why that was, why you were doing that? And then two, what supports are in place to keep that from reoccurring? Yeah. Um, I think that part of it, definitely a lot of it was entitlement and a level of immaturity, emotional immaturity on my, on my part. Um, even though, you know, in the beginning, you have to go through all of these requirements, you know, five years ago, I was going through the motions. And as long as I was not in court or in jail, I guess I convinced myself that that was good enough. Um, and doing things I thought at the time were really externally things I should have been proud of or focused on or proved that I was okay, like it, doing well in school. Um, not breaking the laws, um, being a good sister, a good mom, a, a good uh, friend. And so I, I chose to ignore a lot of those things. And, and it cost me, it cost me a lot. Um, and I, again, I think it kind of goes into like the avoidance behaviors. But I mean, one thing that I really... I'm not here to like brag about, but one of the things that was really important for me and when my sponsor, when I worked together was deciding to navigate the court process with her and with the support of AA members who would go to court with me, but like not having other people involved to bail me out of anything um, and being really transparent with my family and not accepting um, like financial, like as an example, like financial resources for an attorney or things like that. That was a very um, intentional decision. And in addition to being, like with the probation stuff, I've been very intentional about owning all of it on my, you know, myself and not trying to divert any other responsibility to anyone else, um, financially, emotionally, all of it. When I first started this process, I think I really had an immature, underdeveloped, entitled attitude toward the board, thinking that the board had done something to me and made my life so challenging. And after a couple years, I think about uh, preying on probation. I, I think my personal therapy really evolving into my, you know, my therapist and my sponsor really helped me develop a level of accountability that I'm proud of um, and has been really helpful. And it feels good to do the right things because they're right, not to, and not just to do things you think are right or think you're supposed to do. 
Um, I wish I would have had developed that kind of internal moral compass way earlier, but unfortunately it took such a severe um, intervention from the board and I'm grateful that it did. And I think that's, you know, kind of just a testament to my personal growth is the attitude I had about my position, where I was at, why I was in the position I was in five years ago is so much different than my attitude about why I'm in this position and me choosing to, to be on probation and go through this experience and, and take ownership of that and all of the, the natural consequences that have come. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, that really was uh, in line with what I was looking for. Uh, you're taking tremendous responsibility for it, acknowledging where you were at the time and how you've subsequently grown. And I'll just add to it, it also speaks highly of sort of your, the fact that you're asking for a modification and not for early termination. That, that speaks to that too. So I appreciate your answer. And I don't have any more questions. Thank you. All right, Mr. Ranasinghe, do you have any questions? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Ms. Chapman, under examination by one of the board members, um, you mentioned that your sobriety date was, I think you said July 20th, 2015? Yes. Um, but you had a no-show in 2017 to a drug test, as well as those two positive tests. Could, could you explain to me why you maintain, and, and it's perfectly fine if therapeutically you do so, why it's 2015 versus two or three years later? Yeah, um, I, this was something I had discussed with my sponsor at the time um, and we had talked out, but the change in thinking and behaving and decision to eliminate alcohol from my life, um, I wouldn't say the change in thinking yet, but the decision and the commitment was on, started July 20th, 2015. Um, gotcha. And okay. yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of what I was um, wanted to know. Uh, and I think under examination by board member Ehrlich, you mentioned that um, you were taking NyQuil uh, at some point during the positive tests, is that correct? NyQuil? And z -Quil, um, on another. z -Quil. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So, um, and, and it might be different in um, your county, but um, did the drug testing facility ask you whether you were taking any medication or did you have a call from the medical review officer? No. When we go to test, um, especially for that time when I was, um, I had started in, when you guys had changed the companies from Famatech to the company you guys use now, I was assigned a new facility to go to um, in person. And the new facility, when I went there, what you do is you fill out a pro, like the, the questionnaire about what medications you're on and your okay. address and things like that. And then once it's known that you're going to sh show up regularly, like for me, it was four times a month, they make copies of that and put it in a little packet for you to have each time you test. And if there are any changes, um, it is my responsibility to write that on the paper. Um, so I'm pretty confident that even though on the paper I had said when I originally started, the one that was copied, like, no, I'm not on medication, even though I had started taking the NyQuil, the z -Quil, um, I went in with that copied paper that didn't have, and I didn't put an update. Okay. okay. Um, do, do you recall how much, well, let me ask you this. Did you do know you tested for over 3,000 nanograms of ETL? Yes. Which is a substantial number. Yes, that's, okay. yes, that's what I was told. So I guess my last question is, you know, given all this stuff, which happened between 2017, 2018, that's a short time period between now, then and now. Um, the board's concerned with public safety. So how are we to understand that this change is sustainable? Yeah. Um, 
I think on some level, the letters of people, like the letters of recommendations and letters of professionals that we submit on, on our behalf when like, for, for example, my therapist, um, the supervisor that I'm working with, I think on, on some level, besides my own testimony and, and stuff like that has to kind of play a role in, I guess, I don't know, maybe it doesn't, but um, have some credibility, I guess, is what I'm saying. If, if my okay. supervisor and my therapist have consistently over the course of this time mentioned or said, like, we support a reduction in terms, we see that she's safe to practice with the public, we, we, we don't see any red flags or any concerns, um, I guess I would hope that there, that, that comes into play at, at some point on some level. Um, That's, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Ms. Thank you very much. And I think you've done a significant amount of work. Thank you for your testimony today. All right, Mr. Sovek, do you have any questions for Ms. Chapman? I do, thank you. And thank you so much. I know this is a long process, but we're really trying to hear everything that we can to help us with this decision. Um, just a moment, you had mentioned about your letters of reference. And there are actually a point where I do have a little bit of confusion that maybe you can help me understand. Um, we have a series of letters that are people who say, you know, they've known you quite a long time. Um, Rich Wayne, Zara Zanitsky, you know, said they had a long history with you. And they gave you these really powerful recommendations of what a quality person that you were. Were they aware of the legal challenges you were having? Were they aware of the um, not falling through on your probation? Were they aware of the jail time? And how do you think that influences how we should see these letters of recommendation? Yeah. Um, Rich Wayne, I know I had worked with him personally in therapy for a while. Um, I was still drinking at the time when we first started working together and he know he knew and knows about my case and everything that was going on. I don't think he knew the, um, I don't remember having in-depth discussions about violations and um, things like that in terms of the specifics with the court. Okay. Um, the other one was I think a couple of professors who had known me during that time knew of um, my case. And although I, I, I do still know them and keep in contact with them, um, knew about my case, but again, not the specifics in terms of not finishing things on time or violations and um, that thing they knew that I was in therapy they knew that I was in, on probation that I was working with the sponsor um the the weekly and daily changes I was making um but I don't recall like having I'm sure you know if they knew at that time if we had talked more in, in depth about violations and my challenges with that maybe their recommendation letters would have been different I think at the time the focus I remember was being really proud of me for continuing in the field, being in AA, being able to maintain, like develop and maintain a healthy relationship with my at that time fiance, now husband, moving forward in school, those, those kind of things, I, I believe. Okay. I think they looked at these things as markers for mm -hmm. growth and, um, because these letters are presented as character information, and yet it confuses me when we look at just like the original probation piece that was during the time frame these people say that they knew you. Like, so the character they saw versus the character that was actually traveling through your life, missing probation, the jail, and all of that, there's a big disconnect between these letters of referral and who you are presenting to us in the case. Yeah, they, they knew about they knew about jail and um, me and my involvement and acknowledgement that I'm an alcoholic and engagement in AA. Um, and a lot of those character defects that are pretty evident, I think, if you don't know me, um, are there. And I think the people who know me and wrote these letter of recommendations understood that those were things that I was working on 
um, beginning beginning stages of addressing those character defects in um, in in AA. Well, another thing though, and I am staying with the letters for just a moment longer. Um, like in Dr. Zeminska uh, letter, she talks about you excel in your duties as a lab assistant, and you know that you have this level of follow through, and yet when it came to your um, testing, when it came to some of your management of your probation with the board, that wasn't happening previously in your management of your criminal cases, that wasn't showing up. So once again, there's this thing where you're being recognized by a professional for your excellence and your, your diligence in that, but that's not what we're actually needing. Yes. Um... I can I could see that, and I think that the that's part of it. And even though these people knew me in my life, I think because I hadn't maybe when I originally had started, like when I originally came into their lives, like I hadn't even acknowledged that I was an alcoholic yet. And so the things that I was struggling with, or the court process like those weren't things that I was bringing up with these peers and so or other people um, with the exception of the therapists and the professionals who knew me like yeah I continued to excel at school and license and all that other kind of got my license but that didn't um, like really contribute to like this internal growth process that I feel like has really taken off more in the past few like few years like three years, I'd say. Okay. So I'm just going to follow with one more question about this particular subject, because I do have some confusion in my brain still. Dr. Zeminska's letter was 2017. Talked about you being amazing, amazing student and lab tech and assistant to them. A detail-oriented person. But when it came to your probation with the board, that detail-oriented person was not showing up. That's where a lot of my confusion sits. If we hear that you're a detail-oriented person in part of your life, but you weren't in your repercussions and probation with the board, what would encourage us to say, let's modify moving forward? Yeah, um, I think I more clearly understand. So even though she wrote the letter in 2017, I was her lab assistant, I believe in 2012. Um, okay. It was a significant amount of time before. And although we did maintain a personal relationship, um, like a, a relationship where we knew each other. Uh, maybe she was speaking to those things um, from my, that was my undergraduate timeline. Um, it, it sounds like. Okay. And then one final question for you. You mentioned earlier that <clears throat> in the last five years, you've had no challenge with the law. You stopped the speeding ticket challenge. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. You admit, am I correct in hearing you say earlier that in the last five years you have had no challenges with the law? Is that correct? I believe I did say that, and I would like to correct that. I believe what I meant was since I started the process, it was challenging, and I did screw up a lot, and I wasn't by any means close to being perfect. Um, I get I, I shouldn't have said five. Um, I was looking at the past, I, I think it was three, maybe when I finished all of my court requirements and obtained early termination of informal probation. Um, and when I feel like I really like there was a, more of a pattern of change, like in terms of compliance. So not five, five is when the whole process started. Um, but yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Sovak. And Ms. Wong, do you have any questions for Ms. Chapman? Yes. Thank you so much, Your Honor. So, Ms. Chapman, thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> I know it's such a long, long, long discussion from the, um, you know, from all of the board members and, you know, our um, district attorney general. So, um, I, I do have some, some question. Um, let's see. Um, so I noticed that, you know, that, uh, you know, you were on probation, uh, since, um, January 15, 2016. 
And very soon, one year later, a year and a half later, you already make the request for modification. And that was denied because of the violation. And so, um, and then, you know, now, you, you know, and because of the, the violation, you know, you, you were, you know, pro your probation was extended. And in the meantime, you know, you're told your probation because of your pregnancy. And so what I'm, you know, what I'm hearing and seeing is that, you know, it, it, it there's a, you know, from just, you know, the past action, it seems to me that, uh, you know, the probation to you is you just want to get rid of it as soon as possible. And yet, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and yet, you know, the, you know, it looks like, you know, what you said, the character defects and, you know, that you have, you know, it's, it's quite, quite a big deal, you know, from a person, you know, who have a significant, uh, you know, uh, family background to let to who you are. So I, I just really want to know that, um, you know, why do you, you know, I mean, what does it mean to you? you know, that twice that you wanted to get off the board, you know, what really is, you know, is that truly just about, you know, the financial um, burden or is it, you know, really about like, you know, that feeling in, in, inside you that, you know, you just don't like the probation? Um, I don't know the question and I apologize for that. <laughs> um, I, I definitely don't feel like I'm, like in a hurry to get it over because I don't think like I've come to terms to accept that that's not that's not the case <laughs> like that's not going to happen um and I'm sorry what was the second what was the other part no I, I just really want to know your view of the probation because you know what I'm seeing is that you know that you you know because interesting you said you know you've been violating your probation you know for probably the first year while you know during the time that you already wanted to get off probation oh and right really that long ago you know that you got extended for you know for one year yeah. You know, and what I'm hearing, you know, what I'm seeing and what I, you know, what, what you present to the board, that all the efforts that you have done, you know, you have changed all of that. And yet I'm also hearing another, you know, from the fact, you know, wise, that it's a different picture. You know, I guess it's very consistent with uh, Mr. Solvik said, you know, there's that disconnection, what we see, you know, evidence wise versus, you know, what we're, you're trying to, to, to show up. So I just really want to know, you know, kind of, you know, in your, you know, mind, psychologically, your mentally, what really, you know, you're looking at the probation and why you particularly want to get off probation at this time, you know, or maybe in a broader is like, how do you view this probation? Is it just a mere inconvenience for you? Or what is yeah, that? Definitely not. The probation has helped change my life, turn my life around. If it wasn't for the board, like, I probably, I know I would have continued drinking. Um, and I could have, like, my life would be starkly different. Um, I think that I was really lucky in avoiding hurting someone um, or hurting myself. More importantly, some, like, you're really hurting someone. Um, so, no, I don't think... My attitude toward the probation really, I think, I, I guess I probably, I don't know if I'm doing, doesn't seem to be conveying, but I know like, I guess I'm hearing you say like, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. And I guess I feel in my life, the past three years, I've evolved significantly. Um, being a wife and being a mom and all those things, like they've, they've really changed me, but it doesn't explain like my violations four years ago. It doesn't explain um, forgetting to log in. So those things and, and not taking the, the non-compliance letters more seriously. And I mean, I really wish I would have like, understood more of, or, um, I wish I really were, would have worked on the entitlement piece a lot earlier in my life. Um, and that, that particular character defect has contributed to, I think a lot of, um, the problems and, 
even from feeling entitled to drink and be an alcoholic because I had a brother pass away. Well, it's like people experience loss in their lives all the time and they don't necessarily turn to the unhealthy uh, behaviors. Right. So I can't, I don't know if I can speak too much more at my entitlement and inability to really understand the severity of my non-compliance letters and um, court proceedings. I think, you know, once I, comp once I completed them and got to a place where I successfully graduated from all of those programs, I kind of owned more of that identity of getting through it, even though it was imperfect and, and being wanting to align myself more with that version of myself and keeping that being a consistent part of my lifestyle and my values and my behavior. Um, yeah, I think that's. So, um, I, so thank you for the explanation, you know, and, and I, I do want to uh, give you credit, the fact that, you know, you have been working really hard in trying to identify, you know, like you say, the character defects and, you know, and what I also see that, you know, you, you know, because of the character defects, you know, that, you know, there are certainly a lot of the blind spots, you know, in, you know, and how you see the world, how you see the other people, relationships and stuff like that. And so, you know, so my last comment is that I think this is really important as a therapist, that we are healthy enough, you know, to not only, you know, identify our own, you know, in, you know, that our own deficit, but also because of our ability to identify those blind spots and, and those defects, then we're able to help the other people. And so I think, you know, I, I'm, I really encourage you to continue to work on those because I think that is a very important foundation for us to, you know, to see that, you know, you're going to be able to practice, you know, in a healthy and safe manner. So especially, you know, you are in private practice. There is no mechanism to hold you, you know, accountable. And so, you know, so I really encourage you, you know, to continue this, uh, um, this path and you're definitely, you know, on the, on the right track. So do not give up. Thank you. Thank you. I have no more question, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Wong. All right, uh, Ms. Chapman, I know you've, you faced a lot of questions. I just wanted to give you an opportunity at the end with uh, if there's anything you wanted to add um, that you wanted the board to consider before we close the record. Um, no, <laughs> thank you. No, and there's no yeah. obligation to, I don't want my question to seem like, I, like I'm suggesting you have to, just, just yeah. I always like to give people an opportunity at the end. Yeah, no, I just really appreciate um, everyone spending the time to talk to me and you know, ask me questions, understand I think where, um, where I'm coming from a little bit and I appreciate it. All right, thank you so much. And just to make sure uh, no additional documents other than what we've already admitted uh, in support of the petition, correct? Correct. And you don't have any additional witnesses that you wanted to have testify today? No. All right. And Ms. Crawford, no further questions on behalf of the state? The Attorney General? No, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, then, then that concludes the petition hearing in this matter. The record is closed and the case is submitted for decision and you will receive a written decision at some point in the future in the mail. Um, we can go off the record and then Ms. Litz, if you can just give me the, um, the information for the form. Yeah, the time ending is 124, okay. and I have um, 58 pages. Thank you very much. Um, and so I will sign that form, um, and th they will be, I'll make sure that our staff will serve a copy on, on that on you as well, if you want to order a copy of the transcript at any point in time, all right? Thank you so much, Ms. Chapman. All right, and, and then uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Disposti, I'll hand it back to you in terms of how long of a break we're taking, et cetera, for lunch. Correct, thank you, Your Honor. So it's 1.24.25. We are going to take an hour break to 2.25 sharp. I invite everyone to remember that we have two more petitioners to hear, um, and then we have we're going in closed session. So, um, Ms. Wang, I see you raising your hand. 
thinking about in consideration of the time, you know, maybe we should just come back at two o'clock. You know, we we don't want to make keep the judge and you know keep、uh, Miss Crawford over time working over time. So <laughs> maybe we can. No, just- I just、uh, Miss, thank you for that. I I just don't.、Um, I just want to be considerate. Consider that the fact that last time was really a heavy load, and thirty minutes doesn't really help us to recharge. And so、um, I know we、uh, pulled the board before. We asked them if it was okay. So I would like to stay with the same decision. I feel I have the same concern about timing, but I don't want to change it around because it was a big concern last time.、Uh, people really needed to rest.、Um, so if we can. Come back at two twenty-five sharp, and, and and go with the proceeding as expected. I will really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Christina.、Um, so we will re-adjourn at two twenty-five, and、uh, that was my. There we go. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. 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 <laughs>、um, And then our next petitioner would be. Is it Miss Hayes next? Yes,、okay. Connie. Then I'm reopening officially the meeting. Welcome back, everyone.、Um, my name is Max Disposti, board chair of the Board of Behavioral Sciences. We are reconvening for this afternoon sessions at two twenty-seven p.m. on November fifth, twenty twenty, and、um, our judge、uh, Ben Rubin will take、um, on the proceeding. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Disposti. Can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, and do we have Miss Hayes here?、Um, can you hear me well? Yes, I hear you.、Um, it says the host. Okay, I got. There we go.、Up. There we can see you. I thought we saw you earlier today, and now、yes. uh, now we can see you again. Fantastic.、Um, and then I see Miss Litz. If you can just give me a thumbs up, our court reporter. Perfect. Okay, great. Then we're ready to get started. All right, we are on the record before the Board of Behavioral Sciences, Department of Consumer Affairs for the State of California. We are going to review our next petition, which is the petition for reinstatement of license filed by Charlevane Constance Hayes. That is LCSW one six one nine seven and OAH case number two zero two zero one zero zero three five three. My name is Vim Van Royen. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings for the State of California, and I've been assigned to preside over this matter today. Today's date is November fifth, twenty twenty. It was noticed for hearing at eight thirty a.m., and we are still plugging along. It's about two twenty-nine p.m. exactly. We're conducting this matter via Zoom video conference due to the COVID nineteen public health crisis. And the governor's executive order N-25-20, dated March 12, 2020. And then I will also let the record reflect that we did at the beginning of today's board meeting、um, have take a roll call of our board members, and we do have a quorum of the board members present to conduct the petition hearing today.、Um, with that said,、uh, may I have please have an appearance by the attorney general. Mahita Crawford, Deputy Attorney General. And good afternoon to you, Ms. Crawford. Good and, afternoon. And then for the petitioner, if you could just state your name, please. Charlemagne Constance Hayes. Good afternoon, Ms. Hayes. And I'm sorry, I probably grossly mispronounced your name. Apologies for that. Not at all. <laughs> and so、um, you may have observed some of the previous petitions we've had, but I'll just go over the instructions basically for our procedures today. First, our Uh, Deputy Attorney General will proceed to in,、uh, provide us with a background regarding the procedural history of this case, and then we'll introduce、uh, the petition packet. And then after that, Ms. Hayes, you will have an,、uh, the right to make a presentation under oath to explain why your petition should be granted.、Um, and you also have the right to call other witnesses to testify if you wish. And you and those witnesses would then be subject to questioning. By the Deputy Attorney General as well as the board members, and again,、uh, 
the board today is primarily concerned with the rehabilitation that you've engaged in um, since the discipline was previously imposed. Uh, while we will touch briefly on obviously the, the previous proceedings, uh, the main focus is really going forward from that point, uh, what rehabilitative efforts you've engaged in and what would allow you to practice uh, safely and competently uh, in your professional capacity in the state of California. Uh, the board has had the benefit of reading uh, your petition package, and so there's no need to repeat everything that's included in there, but you are certainly free to highlight or emphasize any portions that you uh, wish and that you feel appropriate. And then after the hearing, the board will go into a closed session to deliberate, and uh, so you won't receive an oral decision today, but you will receive a written decision in the mail at some point in the future. Um, with all that being said, Ms. Hayes, do you have any questions before we get started? No. All right, thank you so much. Then I'll turn it over to Ms. Crawford to provide us with an introduction to the case and introduce the petition packet. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Anahita Crawford, Deputy Attorney General, appearing on behalf of the Attorney General's Office, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522. I'm here to assist the panel in fact-finding. My role is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest. The background of this case is as follows. The petitioner was issued a license, clinical social worker license on February 13th, 1992. An accusation was filed on March 18th, 2011. The accusation arises from petitioner's treatment of a couple, SK and KK. She was charged with committing mm -hmm. unprofessional conduct, gross negligence, incompetence, for violating professional boundaries with the couple, and engaging in personal and detrimental conversations with them. She was charged with using drugs in clinical social work when she facilitating a facilitated a meeting between SK and petitioner's boyfriend, where her boyfriend sold SK marijuana. She was charged with violation of patient confidentiality when she disclosed information to her patient's relatives and did not protect the confidentiality of the names of her patients from other patients. Acting beyond competency, she was charged with acting beyond competency by giving medical advice to SK and KK causing patient harm. And she was charged with fraudulent billing for, for sessions that did not occur. Petitioner entered into a stipulated settlement on March 22nd, 2013 for three years probation with terms and conditions. An accusation and petition to revoke probation was subsequently filed on August 24th, 2016. It alleged that the petitioner failed to maintain a valid license in January of 2014, was practicing while her license was expired, made false statements of compliance about her continuing education requirements in 2013 when she counted classes that she had taught towards her continuing education units and failed to timely notify the board that she was not working as a licensed clinical social worker and was in fact residing outside the state in 2015. A default decision was taken, which became effective February 22, 2017. Over three years have passed since petitioner's license was revoked and she is seeking reinstatement at this time. Your Honor, I'd like to move on to the exhibits we're going to introduce. That's perfect, thank you. Exhibit one is uh, the board memo regarding disciplinary history of the petitioner. I would like that marked and introduced at this time. Any objection to exhibit one, Ms. Hayes? No. Exhibit one is admitted. Exhibit two is the notification of hearing to petitioner of today's hearing date that I would like marked and admitted. Any objection to exhibit two? No. Exhibit two is admitted. Exhibit three is the certification of registration history that I would like marked and admitted. Any objection to exhibit three? No. Exhibit three is admitted. 
four is the petition for reinstatement of license and attachments in support. So I'd like marked and admitted at this time. Any objection to exhibit four? No. Exhibit four is admitted. And exhibit five is the accusation, the stipulated settlement and disciplinary order in case number LC 2008, 1163. And also the accusation and petition to revoke probation and the default decision and order from that, which is in case number 2002-016-000318. I'd like to mark and introduce that at this time. Any objection to exhibit five? Um, no, I won't object to the exhibit. All right, so exhibit five is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't have any additional information to present at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Crawford. All right, so uh, Ms. Haynes, now is your opportunity to present your uh, case in support of the petition. Is it your desire to testify today? Yes. All right, if I could have you raise your right hand and I will swear you in. Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you so much. And um, since you don't have an attorney to ask you questions, um, I'm just gonna have you testify freely and let us know what you believe is relevant in support of your petition. As I mentioned earlier on, you can assume that the board members carefully read your petition and the, the attachments to it. So you don't need to repeat everything in there, but you can certainly highlight some or emphasize portions of it, uh, provide additional explanation um, as you wish. Um, and then once you're done with your uh, uh, testimony, uh, then the deputy attorney general may have some questions for you and board members may have some questions for you as well. All right. Um, so okay. and if, if you get any question by anyone that's confusing or you don't understand, just let us know um, and we'll make sure we get it rephrased or clarified for you. If you do answer a question, we'll assume you understood it. Fair enough. Okay, Your Honor, but may I just say, I was, I have an attorney, Dr. James Frankel, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Stephen uh, Frankel, but he had an emergency today. His daughter was assaulted, so she's in the hospital. So um, Andrea Bertram Mueller, my analyst said that she was gonna let her manager know that's why my attorney wasn't present at my oh. hearing today. I'm so I'm gonna go forward. Okay, so so then I, I do just have a couple of questions for you about that. First of all, I, I apologize. I didn't note that you were represented by counsel for some reason, at least yes. OAA records didn't reflect that. So right. Uh, so uh, I in the form, it also said no representation. Uh, also, and I didn't understand that because Dr. Franco has been my attorney of record since the beginning. Okay. All right. Well, in any, in any event, my apologies. I didn't want to brush over that matter. I just, I, I, I wasn't aware. Um, so let me ask you, and I don't need you to get into a lot of information about it, but, but so you are represented by, who is the attorney's name? Dr. Stephen with a V, Frankel. Okay. And so he's had a medical emergency or a family member. Correct. Had All right. Yeah. So here's my question for you. Um, is it still knowing that you're represented by counsel um, and it's a last minute emergency, is it still your desire to proceed representing yourself today? Because um, you know, if there's a request for you to continue this to allow your attorney to represent you, um, I will entertain it. I, I'm not having, I would have to consider it, but I would entertain it if that's your request. I can't wait any longer. I, I, I'm good for what, I, I need to do going forward. I would miss teaching the spring semester and I've waited all year for this hearing and been put off and off and off. I'm, I have no choice but to go forward and just hope for the best. And he tried to uh, advise me as best he could by uh, email. Uh, and so we're just gonna lay it out there. <laughs> All right, and so, and then that's perfectly, that's a fine choice to make to proceed. I, I, I don't mind one way or the other. I just wanna make sure that you know you do have the right to request a continuance 
um, yeah. if you wanted that, and then I would consider that. So, but is it your desire not to request a continuance and instead to proceed today uh, representing yourself? Correct. I'd like All to right. continue. All right. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that clarification. And thanks for bringing the issue to our attention as well. All right. Um, all right, so then with that said, I, I, I've sworn you in. Whenever you're ready, please go ahead and testify, ma'am. Okay, so you don't want me to do like the previous candidates and tell you about the infractions. You just want me to let you know what I've done to rehabilitate myself? I, I, I don't want to constrain you in any way if you think it's relevant to talk about some of the previous infractions in support of your petition, you're more than welcome to. The only thing I was saying earlier on is that the main focus of the board today is your rehabilitative efforts since then. Um, but sometimes people decide it's, it's, they want to talk about it because they want to either show how they've changed or why, or they may want to explain extenuating or mitigating circumstances that took place around the time. So I don't want to constrain you. You can present whatever evidence in support of your petition you think is relevant. That's that's totally up to you. Okay. Okay. Well, I think it's probably just safer to go ahead and review this than just to get it on the record or if nothing else. Um, All right. Hello, board. Thank you for listening to me. My name is Connie and I'm an LCSW with over 30 years of professional clinical experience, psychotherapy, private practice. Um, I was ordered to take both courses, ethical boundaries and, uh, I mean, medical boundaries and ethical boundaries because of the violations that I had to the couple. Um, and you see, they just use their initials. So I'm going to try to stay away from their names, but forgive me if I let it slip. Um, I did that. I, I breached their um, boundaries and uh, confidentiality. And there were uh, dual relationships and without um, me being um, reported to the board, I probably would have gone further and hurt other families. So thank goodness, thank, thank goodness somebody did report it. And from those ethical uh, and boundary classes, I discovered why I did what I did. And I had no idea about slippery slopes or you know, what happens when you become comfortable in your practice and turning 47 and what the danger um, was that existed when you didn't have oversight any longer. Once you're in private practice, I felt very good being out and on my own and I felt confident that I knew what I was doing. The problem was I did not, what I failed to do and what I had always told my interns in supervision, I did not keep up my supervision myself. I didn't stay attuned to the latest and greatest um, laws and expose myself to the new skill set, the best practices. I didn't, I just went on practicing and fighting. And when I say fighting, I mean that I had a full-time job where, um, please forgive me, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I was not uh, received well on that job. I was the most highly educated um, clinician at, at the County of Santa Clara, and they did not want to receive any guidance, supervision, orders, direction, nothing from a black person, let alone a black professional. They made it known every day that I walked in that office. So I felt like I was constantly in turmoil, in angst and in a fight until I got to my private practice when I graciously relaxed and I should not have relaxed because I ended up hurting that family. And I let my guard down and I didn't stay sharp as I taught in the past and things just snowballed. They snowballed. And I learned so much. I mean, from traveling to Atlanta, to New York, from my boundaries courses. And I mean, I studied with some of the top notch experts in boundary violations. And um, going all the way up and down the coastline in California, I got, every 
everything that I could. I was a sponge because I don't ever want this to happen again. And I don't want any of my colleagues to experience what I experienced. That being said, I know where I went wrong, how to fix it was even harder because you had to uh, admit to so much wrongdoing and have so much insight whether you wanted to see it or not, it had to be literally in your face to fix it. And that was very hard. I made a decision. I'm gonna retire from this job because my private practice, the lives of others that have been entrusted to me are much more important and more valuable. I put in 22 years for that county, whether they wanted it or not, I needed to have um, retirement benefits, but I, didn't realize the harm that I was doing to those that were entrusted to me, not just my patients, but my children. Uh, so I, I admit all of the wrongdoing that I did. There were some misnomers in those uh, petitions. I jotted down a couple of things that were said. This um, sessions that did not occur, please let me explain what that was. As a social worker, we are trained to use every resource that we have available. In graduate school, that's what they taught us. Now, maybe it was in the days of yore or in the olden times as you will remember, but I, the family that I was seeing said they were overwhelmed. They could not do their billing. They uh, would get the runaround from their insurance company. So yeah, I did their billing and then I billed for it. I truly didn't know that I could not count that as social work because that's not part of private practice. That is straight social work. Once it was clarified, okay, I never did it again, but I wasn't trying to break the law. I wasn't trying to cheat. That's why it was no big deal to me. You understand this... Um, falsification of CEUs. Again, I didn't know if I was teaching the class that I couldn't get credit for what I was teaching. I wasn't trying to be manipulative or sneaky or anything. And the way that um, it was told to me by uh, the board was, no, you can't do that. Go get some real CEUs. So from that point forward to today, I get my CEUs outside from CE for less and I pay for them and there's no discrepancy. And that's the way I'll train my new interns. You see, so yeah, I have no excuses for the wrongs that I did that were in the accusations and the petitions. I have corrected them. I am very learned about everything that went wrong and I have fail safes in place for that, not just, um, my church, I have mentors, I have my sorority members, I have my LCSW supervisors that are always in place. If I cannot be available, I have two clinicians that are on paper willing to accept my patients for me. I have my rules and regulations that have been written up and there is no, oh my goodness, um, this, um, Christian thing. One of the petitions said she blessed the house. I blessed the house because the patients asked me to bless the house. Okay. They insisted that they had spirits inside their home. Could I help them get them out? No problem. But that should have been a problem and it should have been a red flag for me. Okay. I didn't realize that being a Christian counselor like United Behavioral Health wanted me to be was a boundary violations that those two things should have remained separately. And if you were gonna put them together at any time, there should be very clear and succinct guidelines in writing. As the patient comes through the door, you need to hand them a copy of what those guidelines are. I had no idea. I just went and blessed the house on the outside. So, you know, there, there's so much that I learned that I did wrong, that I never will repeat, but uh, I have been asked to come back to my undergrad alma mater to teach. They're asking for me to come for the spring semester. Um, I don't know when 
or if my license will be reactivated, but I would like to do that so nobody else makes these mistakes. I am an excellent instructor, but even better, I'm an excellent student and I have learned and I will learn every day. When I said I have fail safes in place to make sure I don't falter again, the heaviest fail safe that I have in place are those three girls that are in that pack. Uh, Mom, uh, did you really just ask us how much we paid for that? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't realize that that was a boundary violation. I didn't realize it was inappropriate. I figure since you came out of me, I could ask you whatever I wanted. No, ma'am, you can't. I'm an adult now. That's my business and belongs with me and my husband. And they don't hold anything back in advising me of such things. And I love them for it because I never want to be in error again with my practice, nor as a person. I don't want to harm anyone. So um, I've also been asked by the state of um, Ohio to come to Talbert House during this COVID season to help the traumatized um, family members because of my history with uh, trauma and social services. I would have to do that on a piecemeal basis, um, but I have to have my license back in order to do it. Other than that, um, you all are free to ask me questions. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Hayes. Um, I'm, I'm gonna have Ms. Crawford um, jump in and see if she has any questions for you. Ms. Crawford, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Ms. Hayes. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to know why you did not respond to the accusation and petition to revoke probation, which led to um, a default revocation of your license. Can you give me the year that you're talking about? Sure. Um, the accusation and petition to revoke were filed in August of 2016. Okay. In August of 2016, I had moved twice. I did, had no idea where my mail was going. So I didn't know until I got in touch with my uh, analyst, Craig Zimmerman. He was the one who told me that there had been a revocation. I think that was the analyst at that time. But um, my mail was going to San Jose. I had already left uh, Denver, Colorado or Greeley, Colorado, where I had a, a medical injury. And I moved to Southern Cal Colorado for my surgery. I mean, sorry, Southern California for my surgery. So I had moved twice since that time. And had you kept your address updated with the board? Do you recall if you I did, did that? I did. I spoke with my analyst, Julie McAuliffe, and I told her everywhere I was. I also asked her, do I need to write you something or send you something? No, was her response. You've been in contact with me. I can reach you whenever I need to. I got both your numbers right here, no problem. She okay, told so me I did not to send her anything. Okay, um, so you, provided Miss McAuliffe with your address, but yes. you didn't fill out any kind of form that went to the board to update your address of record. I didn't fill out any kind of form. No. Okay. Okay. And since your license has been revoked in 2017, where uh -huh. have you been residing? Southern California, Los Angeles, and Ohio. Okay. How, how, um, how long do you remain in California and how long do you go to Ohio for? I've already moved from Southern California. I'm no longer in California okay. um, at all. I've already moved everything over to Ohio waiting to teach. <laughs> I'm not going okay. back. Okay. Oh, you're not coming back to California. 
not unless the board says you can only practice here <laughs> or something. Then I'll come home. Okay. So why I still are you have seeking house there? Uh, I see. And why are you seeking reinstatement of your California license? Um, Ohio has said that uh, they would grandfather me in here uh, to, in the, to this state, and then I could practice here. Uh, but it's, it's past time, like three years past, when my license should be reinstated. Um, the last form that Exhibit 5 that you wanted to talk about, I, I don't agree that there should have been a revocation. There should not have been a revocation. I did what the board asked me to do. I stayed in contact with my analysts. I paid all of my fees. I attended all of my classes. I did my supervision and my psychotherapy. And that uh, something happened with that analyst with her uh, lack of professionalism. There was no reason that the license should have been revoked. Okay. Now with um, the fact that Ohio has said you can get grandfathered in there if your license is reinstated here, what Correct. if it's not reinstated? How can you um, have your license? How, how will you obtain a license in Ohio if that's your plan? I won't, I'll just come back to California and start over. I'm gonna practice. I'll just start over. Okay, so you wouldn't seek licensure in Ohio? No, if you won't reinstate my license here, I mean, for the reciprocity, the grandfathering in to happen, I'll go back to California and pick up where I left off and try to get my license there and just move, move back. Okay. So I did want you to kind of walk us through your petition packet because there's a lot of information in there um, that maybe needs a, a little bit of your explanation for us to fully understand it. Um, first of all, I wanted to know because a lot of a lot of your character letters are ad are addressed to psychotherapy consultants. Yes, that's and, my private practice name. The petition packet can you have do you have a page number? Sure. Um, do you have the packet that I sent you? Because uh, those no. were pa those were page numbered. Uh, that's tiny. It's on the it's on the phone. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, okay. But, but I have a hard copy with some attachments that I think that petition is included in here. Okay. So, um, so if you so tell the me petition what you're is sure the petition is what you filed with the board to get your license reinstated. So it'd be all oh, the handwritten your thingy. documents. Okay. Yeah. Let's do and and you had lots of attachments to to that right some That's, character letters and the pictures of the girls okay all uh -huh. right yes let me pull that up okay i'm there okay Page so 14. what i am looking at um is for example there's a letter dated February 4th, 2020. The letterhead says Santa Clara Valley Health and Hospital Systems. And mm -hmm. it's from mm -hmm. Andrew Pham. Andrew mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's, that's addressed to psychotherapy consultants. And I was wondering right. what psychotherapy consultants is and how it relates to you. Yep. That's the name of my private practice, psychotherapy consultants. That is one of the patients that had his license reinstated with me as his therapist. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I am, I'm also noticing it's dated February 4th, 2020. That's the date so, that I asked him for the letter. Okay. Uh -huh. Are you licensed in any... Are you licensed in any other capacity where you're able to provide therapeutic services? Uh, therapeutic services. Not therapeutic services, but I am licensed. You, you, I have like 11 licenses in other states for my 
insurance adjuster. I had to have those to get to Colorado. Okay, when, when so the, when, let me ask you a clear question because I don't think okay. I was very clear. Um, Actually, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Crawford, no. this is Judge Van Royen. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt your questioning, but I just want to remind both, both the questioning and the answering party, um, please make sure Ms. Uh, Hayes, just to wait till Ms. Crawford is completely done with her question before you start answering. And, and likewise, Ms. Crawford will wait until your answer is completely done before she starts asking. Otherwise, it makes it impossible for our court reporter to get the transcript accurate. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and no offense taken at all. That's sometimes we just have to remind people along the way. So no harm done. Just want to make sure we get a clear Absolutely. Back. Thank you. All right. Uh -huh. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so my question is, what is psychotherapy consultants? just the name of my private practice. Since 1992, when California issued my license, psychotherapy consultants was my business name, the okay. name of my business, uh-huh. And you stopped practicing under psychotherapy consultants once your license was revoked, correct? Yes, whenever. Okay they told me it was revoked. Right. So the revocation happened in 2017. Is that your recollection as well? Right. I didn't see okay. any patients after that. Okay. And why are these letters still addressed to psychotherapy consultants when these letters came in this year? That's the name of my private practice. The practice hasn't gone anywhere. That name is copywritten. That's mine. That belongs to me. It doesn't get dissolved because the Board of Behavioral Sciences says we're going to take your license back from you. It's that copywritten name belongs to me. You understand what I'm saying? That There hasn't been any practice under that title. It is just a business name. Okay. And uh -huh. Um, I blocked out the address associated with that business because I wasn't I sure if it was that. your residence or not, or not. Yeah. And I didn't want your confidentiality to be violated, but um, that address, is that a business location or is it your home location? Home. Okay. And um, you also provided and I'm going to exhibit, just for the record, it's exhibit four, page 14. There's a picture of um, three young women. Mm -hmm. And I believe you alluded to, those are your daughters? Those are my three girls. Okay. And was there anything about this document you wanted to share with us with regards to your petition? Those are the three that keep me in line that say, mom, that's a boundary violation. The older girl has a special needs daughter. Her name is Kyla. She is now turned eight. I was the one that was teaching Kyla before COVID happened. Once COVID happened, I ended up teaching all the kids, all three of her babies. Whether there's a COVID or not, I'm not going to stay here at the expense of my license. She'll have to get somebody else to do that if California says, we don't care about reciprocity. We don't care about grandfathering in. We want you to come back here and do more mediatorial work and go back to California, then I'll go back to California. But that older child is attached to me because she's sick, but um, other than that, they rely on me. And I got those three children when I was, um, what do you call that? Violating, when I began that slippery slope in my private practice, mm -hmm. I was raising those girls by myself. Their Chinese dad wanted boys. 
he was raised in the caste system. He told me they weren't boys. I could pay for them to go to school myself. So I had to work those two jobs. Private practice in the evening, County of Santa Clara straight days. And on the weekends, I taught them and took them to church. So when I tell you I was tired, there was always a fight. I fought at home and at work. The only place that I remained comfortable was my private practice, but it was too comfortable. It was the wrong place. Boundaries were blurred. You see, I got other needs met there that I shouldn't have because of what was going on in the other parts of my life. But I didn't learn that until I violated. You, you see what I'm saying? So those three girls helped pull me out. And because they are scholarly now with their MBA, double masters, and now the baby is, you know, got her bachelor's from Purdue and working at Oracle, they don't allow me, they don't let me slip. They saw the devastation once I lost my license. Um, and I don't, when I say lost my license, I'm talking about the three years probation. That revocation, I am not counting as mine. I did the harm to the couple. Okay. So it's important to me that the board knows I raised those girls by myself, but I got in trouble doing it. Never are my patients supposed to have seen them, met them, commented on them, bought any Girl Scout cookies. I didn't even realize that that was a boundary violation. You understand what I'm saying? However small, but everything was so enmeshed in my life because I didn't take time to have the supervision that I needed, that I now need to go back and tell everybody, this is how you do it. And you have to stay on top of it. So there's a lot of um, learning that I had to do, relearning, unlearning, and now a lot of teaching, but I don't, I, I don't wanna lie. And I don't wanna misrepresent and say, well, you know, the board did everything right by me. No, you did not. I was a good rehabilitative candidate. I paid my dues and then something happened with my analyst that wasn't proper. And all of these horrible things came out on paper that I shouldn't be held accountable for. But uh, my attorney is not there. So I'm gonna do the best I can and going forward. Um, I also wanted you to explain um, why you put in another document. It's for the record, it's exhibit four, page 17. And it's okay. got a heading of certificate of insurance. So what is this document and why did you include it in your packet? You wouldn't believe it if I told you. Um, once, <laughs> once that analyst told me um, no, Everything the board tells you to do, you got to prove it to us. That's what Julie McCullough told me. I said, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know. So I started submitting my NASW payment that I had to keep up with every year, whether I worked or not. My malpractice insurance, whether I worked or not. My CEUs, whether I worked or not. Every dime that I spent every year, for that license that I couldn't practice under, I included it, but, but there was no practice. I mean, there was no work going out. There was just continual money on top of the probation cost and the defense cost and all. It was, so I included, see, I'm still keeping up with everything that you said. It was maddening, but I thought that, I had to do it or else she was going to say I violated something else. So this this is, looks like it's for professional liability. That's what the certificate of insurance is. Mm -hmm. okay. Malpractice and insurance. Malpractice insurance. And Correct. its effective date is um, 2020 through 2021. Correct. Um, Every year. 
Okay, so you're keeping your malpractice insurance up even though you're not practicing in California or seeing any patients? Every year, correct. Okay. I pay all those expenses, ACSW, LCSW, NASW, and malpractice insurance. And is that just in the hopes of um, having your license reinstated? That's because she told me I had to. Oh, even after your license was revoked, it's your belief you still have to do that? That's what she told me. I'm going under what Julie McAuliffe told me to do. Okay. And I see that you've taken um, several continuing education courses um, in 2019 and 2020. There was one document, and I'm looking for it right now, that had to do with a formula, a calculation. Yeah, that's my having to do with smoke, girl. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Can you, ex- can you explain that? Because I don't think it's um, self-explanatory. Okay. We have, there's two of them. The first one is on page three. That is my b- boundary violation. Okay. And that's going to be exhibit um, four, page 32. For Correct. The record. Okay. When you have a, a boundary violation, all it says is that you have risk factors and vulnerabilities. You put those two together and they're like potentiated. Think of an implosion, okay? That's gonna cause you to violate. And this is in any profession, in any profession. But for us it's detrimental because other people are entrusting their lives to us. They're giving us access to their most private thoughts, their minds, their own well-being. You put this implosion that's going on in us and you have all of this um, damage underneath that's the outcome. Just think of it like a, a fraction. My risk factors that are up top Plus the, vul- I mean, times the vulnerabilities that are on the bottom are nine times six. And think of synergy and potentiation. That's not gonna be 54, that's gonna be something like 2000. So I'm gonna hurt people in the long run. My risk factors were hugging because I'm an extrovert. Um, not having a commercial office, my office was in my home, but that office being in my home gave my patients access to my boyfriend and he met the the husband of that couple. Those two got together and decided, hey, let's buy some, some weed. Okay, it wasn't me using or me selling, but without me having my practice in the home, they would have never come together. I was a sole practitioner That's another risk factor where if I had had a partner in my private practice, whether it was in my home or commercial office, we would have had a check and balance system and say, hey, did you realize that, you know, uh, Mr. So-and-so just ran into your husband? We got to get another entrance in here because that's not supposed to happen. There was no office manager or chaperone. The same for the checks, checks and balances. I practiced long and late hours, but they were because of my personal needs, raising those three girls by myself, having to pay for everything. It wasn't the patient's fault. So whether I was weary, worn out, on Topamax or whatever, it came out one way or the other. It was lack of good judgment. It was a lack of health. It wasn't putting the patient's need first. Our ethics say do no harm that means we have to stay healthy enough to practice in this case my risk factors say that i wasn't staying healthy enough there was misuse of clinical knowledge yeah i knew all about harm reduction so 
that patient, the male patient may have needed to use from time to time, but those instructions should have come through his physician, not the therapist, me. And I didn't even realize that until I went to my medical class. Whew. Uh, the private practice fees being too low. I'm gonna trump up my patient caseload as high as I can because I need the money. You see, that's not good. My patient's needs should come first. And the last risk factor was the incident would make for a previous complaint. Yeah, of course, you take any one of those things, there could be a complaint launch, launch. But for me, I had them all. Those plus the six below my vulnerabilities. You want me to go through the vulnerabilities too? I can, well, I don't first, mind. Go first, ahead. I'm curious about um, where this formula came from. This is my, my medical ethics class. Okay. Professional so Boundaries Incorporated at UC Irvine, PBI. Dr. Shinthal, have you heard of him? Dr. Shinthal. No. Okay. Well, but that well, doesn't this, mean anything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that I haven't. Okay. He, that course, let me just put it to you this way cost a thousand dollars. I would have paid three thousand. Now that I know what's entailed and involved in it and what I learned from it, no price is too high to actually delve into what happened. What did I do? How did I get there? And how do I get back? They are wonderful. And that's how I ended up going all the way across the nation. Atlanta, New York. Um, and uh, up and down California. But these formulas work. They are wonderful. They don't, um, there's no way to, to be wrong. They, they're, they're just true. You're going to hurt people if you have this combination. You fill in the blanks. So. Okay, and that, that looks like that's what you've done in exhibit four, page 35, where Correct. you have at the top of the page, boundaries in the ethics protection plan, January yes. 2020. Yes. Okay. This is my protection plan. And it's that's, work. And I'm sorry, it's work? It has worked. It, it has worked. It's brought me where I am today, and where my insight is heightened. And, and I know the error of my ways, what I did, and how I could have prevented it, and what not to do. That's what they want me to teach. <laughs> but okay. most people don't, um, don't pay that kind of, they, uh, how, how do you even, um, it, it hurts to, to do this. This is extremely painful. It is, I would say, let me put it to you this way. Most people would have to be hypnotized to delve this deep or stay in therapy for years to extrapolate everything that's wrong with you. But of course I believe in our profession. So I let them dig and I embraced what, what do you mean? I wasn't supposed to sell them the Girl Scout cookies. My kids, they do this and the other. This isn't about your kids. This is about a private practice where you're telling people to come in and get their mental health needs met. You know, and I'm telling you, Professional Boundaries Incorporated, they break it down and they break it down in love. We had doctors, nurses, attorneys, shaman. <sighs> I mean, you name it, everybody was there getting the help that they needed. It's very in-depth and intense. So uh, it's clear to me that you've um, certainly done a lot of work around boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. My question, though, is that in your statement, you have said that you are um, very skilled, you're very well educated, you've had mm -hmm. teaching jobs. Um, yes. Why, why did you not recognize simple things 
well, things that were boundary violations. Why were those things not in your knowledge base when you are so skilled and educated in your work? Because what I failed to do was keep abreast of the latest and greatest. All the dual relationship classes that the County of Santa Clara offered, I thought I knew those. I didn't go. I didn't go until I was mandated to go. The, all the ethics courses, I didn't go. I thought I knew them. I had already taken ethics, law and ethics as an attorney, I mean, as a class at McGeorge. I was like, Psh, I don't need that. Legal ethics are totally different from our ethics. But I did not, I was ignorant. I truly, truly thought I knew it all. And I'm telling you, I did not realize how much I didn't know until I went to both sets, the legal, um, ethical, and the medical boundary courses. You had to go to both sets to realize what's missing. There are so many different pieces. It, attorneys can do different things than, than psychotherapists can do. They're two totally different avenues. But no, I wasn't aware because I didn't keep up with those courses. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if your license is reinstated, what is your plan? With, to do, what do you plan to do with your California license? Well, it depends. Uh, if it is reinstated, I don't want to go back to California. I'd rather accept the teaching jobs in the Midwest uh, to, come, to do what I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, the teaching jobs for health and human services and all the social work uh, courses in humanities. I'd rather stay out here closer to the family. If it is not reinstated, then I'll go back to California and start over. I'm not giving up, uh, you know, I got the MSW in 83. I'm not gonna give up my love. I, I just, I won't. I will keep trying until I get it right. And, and, and what does starting over mean? Well, I don't know what the board requires. Remember, I'm not even agreeing with that revocation part. I don't know what the board is going to require of me, but whatever that requirement is, I'm going to meet it. I'm going to okay. exceed it. I will do whatever you tell me you want me to do, just like I did with the three years probation and for some reason still wasn't good enough uh, and, and start over it. If you say, no, we don't want you, I will go all the way through my written and oral boards again Are you currently to, to, licensed in, in Ohio? I'm sorry. In, in order to practice, that's all I say. Okay. Go ahead. Um, are you currently licensed in Ohio? Not as a psychotherapist. Okay. And is there any impediment to you becoming licensed as a psychotherapist in Ohio? Uh, no, they've already said they would accept me being grandfathered in if my license is reinstated in California. The biggest impediment would be money and time. I don't want to restudy and take the written and oral again if I already have that foundation. Plus, I already know what not to do on top of it. That I would not want to do that. And it would be too expensive for me to pay for since I'm retired now. I, I retired from the County of Santa Clara, so I'm on a fixed income. That's the biggest impediment, time and money. But um, they've already agreed that they would grandfather me in. So and, and, not from their standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I may not be understanding some of the, some of the verbiage. Um, okay. I understand being grandfathered in means that you wouldn't have to sit for any exam with the Ohio board, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so if you're not grandfathered in, don't you still have the opportunity to take the exam and apply to the board in Ohio to become um, a social worker? Right, but why would I do that if I've already done it in California? And so my question was if, if you're not reinstated in California, you would prefer to move back here and get reinstated versus staying in Ohio and taking their exams? 
It depends on what what California's requirements are. I do you know those? I, I don't know those. I don't know what California standards are, and I'm not in agreement with having been revoked in the first place. You understand what I say? In my mind, I'm still supposed to have a California license. It that something happened that okay. I was no, I I don't think I can I don't think I can rightfully answer your question until I know what uh, decision the board has about my analyst or what fault happened with my analyst or until my case is looked at. Because if you look at the wording on what you guys sent me uh, as far as what I did for it to be revoked, that's I'm not in agreement with that. But I agree to the exhibit being there but I, mm -hmm. I, I mm. so I think there's something, the piece missing, if you will, but I'll go back to California if I have to, if that's where I need to be to practice. Okay. So your license was, that default was taken against your license in February of 2017. Do you know when you discovered that your license was revoked? Whenever I talk to Craig Zimmerman, I, I, I really don't remember the date. Do you know uh, if it was in 2017? Could have been, it, 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 it was either 2016 or 2017. Okay. You know, and I'm sorry, Dr. Frankel is not here with us. I'm sure he would have that information, but I, I just don't know. I mean, this is a really, really old case. And I, I, I just don't know. Okay. But the only reason, and, and just to clarify, I, I want the board to understand the only reason my body was not in California was because I had these costs that were associated with my own infractions where I had to pay back the board for probationary fees and all of that. So I retired from the mean job at the County of Santa Clara, got licensed as an independent real estate adjuster and got a job in Colorado making $2,500 a week. That meant I could pay for the girls tuition and my board of behavioral science fees at the same time, I told my analyst this and she said, I understand, do what you gotta do. We can toll, she used that term with me. She spelled it T-O-L-L. -L. We can toll this for a while if we need to. Hey, you're doing a great job, keep going. I know how to reach you. So okay. that's why my body was not in California. I even rented the, the California home to somebody else. So no, I, I wasn't getting half of my mail, but I put in repeated, repeated change of address forms. I did the best that I could. Okay. And since you've been in Ohio and since your revocation, what have you been doing? What kind of jobs have you been doing? Oh, no. I was retired. I do those CEUs. I read books, <laughs> everything I can get my hand on. I still go to church. I'm active with my sorority and I raise those grandbabies because of the uh, special needs with the older one. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of that illness uh, before. I had never heard of it, but it's only because She's eight years old and she's almost as tall as I am. I'm five nine, but the, the blood doesn't reach her brain. So she keeps passing out and she can't make it through a whole class session, like a one hour at a time. So you, you, of course you can't be in school like that. COVID was good for her in that way because she had one person teaching her. Uh, that being said, I'll leave her for my license. I want you to be clear on that. 
and let that family, because they're both MBAs, pay for somebody to come in and take care of her. But that's what I've been doing, taking care okay. of them and helping them for the most part. But I'm, I'm ready to go back to work. The university has called me. Um, Chelsea, the, the middle girl, the one with her own company, the coaching factory, is on the board of directors for the School of Liberal Arts at Purdue. That's not my school. That's a totally different division. So I'm getting hit from every angle saying, are you still coming to teach? Where, where are you? We need you now. And um, I don't know. I, I don't know. All I know is uh, Miss Mueller said it's six to eight weeks for a decision from you all. The spring semester starts up in January. And I, you know, I'm at the mercy of what the board wants me to do. And I'm feeling very um what would be the word since this is my petitioner's hearing? I'm feeling very sad, very distrusting that um, that I did a wonderful job uh, with my rehabilitation, and um, it was somehow misconstrued or falsified or not given the sanction that it should have been. And for three years, I was out of practice when I should not have been, I, I, I should not have been in that predicament. I should have been in the predicament where I was with these charts, you know, fixing this and correcting this. This was all me. But uh, after that time, I paid my penance. I, I righted the wrongs that I had done. And uh, then something else escalated. But um, I'm so sorry that Dr. Frankel can't be here. And I, 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 I don't mean to take up much more of your time. I just, I know that I can help people now without hurting them. And that means something to me. Thank you very much. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. All right, I will turn it over to the board members to see if they have any questions. And I'm going to start in reverse alphabetical order, as promised. So, Ms. Wong, I believe you're first. Do you have any questions for Ms. Hayes? Yeah, just a very, very simple factual question, Ms. Hayes. Um, I want, first, I want to thank you for being so patient and um, waited for so long, you know, for this hearing. Um, I just want to um, clarify, um, since your license being revoked, did you uh, practice any psychotherapy, whether it's in California, Colorado, or, or uh, Ohio? No. Okay. So, um, and you did say that, you know, the psychotherapy consultants is your company. Mine. Okay. So, you know, and I did notice that, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, the this, this statement about the boundary and ethics, um, ethics pr protection plan. Mm -hmm. So is it, you know, that the letter, is it from your own company, the letterhead? You know, the, I, I would, so it's, you know, that letter, um, let's see. Oh, oh, you're looking, oh, because it's still on my, oh, on my letterhead when I wrote it to Dr. Shenthal. No, yeah. he had to approve this plan. Oh, I see. And okay. at this time, my practice was still open when I wrote this. Okay. Maybe okay. that's what some of the questions, yeah, I, my practice was still open when I wrote this. They hadn't violated me with this revocation thing yet. Oh, I no, I still had um, patients at this time Michael and Adamson was still coming to me then, but I still have it now too, but I, I haven't, don't have any patients coming through I, there. I just, sorry, this is Judge Van Royen. I just want to make sure the record is clear. What letter are we referring to? Um, uh, Ms. Crawford, you can jump into if you know what you think, if, if you think. So it will be the, uh, the letter uh, that Ms. Hayes wrote and it titled, um, you know, it has all the, uh, the, Greek letters, and it's actually, it's the last letter uh, in our attachments. 
So that letter has how many pages? Has uh, eight pages. Got, it's exhibit four. Exhibit four, the last letter. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I just wanna make sure the record's clear what we're looking at. Yes, yes, and thank you, Judge. Um, I actually wanna you know, just point out because you know, Ms. Hayes, you're still using your LCSW license uh, number. You know, and, always. Yes, and so you know, I just want to make sure that you you know you you know that uh, um, you know if you're when your license is revoked and you know you really are not supposed to use the LCSW title. And so I was just a little confused. So thanks for what? Clarifying. You mean my four alphabet was supposed to be removed? No way! Oh, Miss Wong, you are kidding me. Well, I don't know. Did I open a can of worm? <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Give me my license back. Oh, oh, oh my God. Oh no. No. I had, no see? I know. Mm -mm. I did not know. Mm -mm. Okay. I thought why all this was pending that I was supposed to go ahead, go forward, go forward. I even signed my my petition thing, LCSW. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> if that's not doing this to the board, oh my God, please forgive me. I'm telling you, I had no knowledge, but I went on old instruction with that CEUs, the malpractice insurance. You mean to tell me I'm supposed to be paying for all of those fees and then drop the license, the, the initials? Well, you know, so I don't know how, to, um, you know, practically, yes, because, you know, no when you, way. So, so just, just, just so we don't, the board members don't need to answer questions or Thank give you. advice. So that's, it's, it's, it's fine. Um, but I think, I think, you know, as a factual matter, the, the question was, if you're, it sounds like you are still using your LCSW uh, uh, initials, initials uh, on your documentation and that, as I'm understanding your testimony, you didn't you didn't realize that you were not supposed to be doing that. I did not. All right. Did, okay. Was uh, there I, a letter or something that were that I got that said don't use it? I, I, I again again, Ms. Hayes, uh, the board members can't answer your questions, but you can certainly tell us if you never received a letter to that effect. Oh, okay. And, uh, great. Yeah. Great. I never received a letter <laughs> that said don't use it. But I, I guess common sense would say this has been revoked. You can't, you, no, 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 mm -mm. no. I think um, somewhere in Dr. Franco's notes, there was, um, you would see that there was something that transpired that um, I, where I asked him what I was supposed to do. And I think I was advised to keep going. But, you know, I'm not trying to throw him under the bus by any means, but I do believe I had a conversation with my attorney. Yeah, and, and we, don't, we don't need to hear about conversations between you and your attorney. Now. Right, right. But, um, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying, though. So, well, uh, until I get a decision, I will stop. <laughs> All right, any further questions, Ms. Wong? No, no further question, Your Honor. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> no, you. Thanks, I appreciate Ms. it. Okay, uh, let's see, going backwards after Ms. Wong, I believe we have Mr. Sovek. Do you have any questions? Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I just have a couple of questions about the letters of reference that you provided in your packet. Um, it's letters. Ms. Crawford had mentioned the letter from Andrew Patrick Fahm, which is dated on February 4th, 2020. When did you actually treat him? Ooh, two years, um, maybe three. Um, I don't know. Off and on from in San Jose from like 2014 was the first time that I saw him briefly. And then he got in trouble again. 
So it was sporadic, but I think the first time was in 2014. And the last time was when I was in um, Colorado. So you were in the state of Colorado and you still had interactions with him? Yes, I asked. Uh, my analyst, was it okay for me to see him on the FaceTime? We did FaceTime uh, visits and I saw him once a week. Okay, thank you. It was you. only for a short period of time, but I did. And then following up, you also have a letter from Andrea Martinez, which would be the next letter in this series, dated okay. February 19, 2020. Also saying that um, you've been a career mentor and a coach for them. When were you having these uh, interactions with them? When were you working with them? Oh, Let's see what year? Andrea Martinez, two thousand and one, maybe began with Andrea Martinez until um, maybe. I don't know when they moved, uh, maybe 20, 2007, possibly. Okay, that so time this is period, an older, 2001 to 2007. So I this is an you, older sorry. working relationship then? Yes, uh-huh. At okay. the county. I have no I'm further sorry, questions. I'm sorry, everyone. Let's, let's, let's stop because I don't think I didn't get the interchange and neither did our court reporter. So, Mr. Sovic, could you repeat your last question and then you answer it? Because if you were speaking over each other, we can't uh, take that down. I apologize for that. That was actually me. Um, <laughs> so your working relation with this, with Andrea, was an older working relationship. Correct. At the county. <laughs> Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ranasinghe, do you have any questions? No, Your Honor, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I think, uh, let's see, next would be Mr. Maddox. Do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Herwick? I do have a question. Um, let me think of how I'm going to word this. So I know you said that you maintained your license over this period of years. And one of the requirements is that we, that licensed individuals do a law and ethics course every renewal period. So I'm curious if that's a course that you actually took every two years or if that you missed. Okay, I'm sorry, you froze. Okay. The the end. You could just re, re ask the question, Ms. Herwick. I appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Uh, every two years, licensed individuals are required to take the law and ethics course as part of their CEs. Was that right. a course that you took every two years or was that missed over the extent of your license? That was a course that I took every two years. It was a boilerplate course. You know what I mean by boilerplate? They taught you the same exact, very benign, very surface material. They did not go in depth with um, any intricate, it, it was, no, it was nothing like what seasoned clinicians who had been practicing over 10 years needed. It, it no, it was totally different. Uh, than what the professional boundaries incorporated offer. And I'm not trying to plug that institution. I'm telling you that without that insight based type of um, instruction on where to, to look for what's wrong, I, I, I think I probably would have been at a loss. The, the boilerplate classes that we had to take every year were only PowerPoint presentations that they would give you front and back. Here, fill this out, check off your, your list and go get your CEUs. You know, it, it, it wasn't, it was surface level only. And they were mm -mm, nothing like um, the courses that we had uh, on the professional level 
for our infractions. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you, Ms. Herwick. And then uh, Ms. Friedman, did you have any questions? I have one quick question. Thank you very much for being here. I know it's complicated for you, but I'm just curious, where did you get your original degree where you got those four letters that went after your name? <laughs> well, I did the undergraduate work at Purdue and then I got where I was, uh, then I went to Howard University and got the MSW. And I was the youngest black to be inducted into the Academy of Sol Certified Social Workers, ACSW. And I've been paying for that ACSW right up until this year. I, 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 I can't believe that I, I, I wasn't supposed to, or I didn't have to, but man, on a fixed income, it makes a difference. I really, I just didn't know that, but I thought that I was doing the right thing, but yeah, it was Howard University. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. Good, good, good instruction. All right, uh, Mr. Ehrlich, did you have any questions? I do not have any questions at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. And I think Mr. Disposti, did you have any questions? Not further questions, just thank you. Thank you so much again uh, for being here today, Ms. Hayes, thank you. Okay. All right. Ms. Hayes, you've been asked a lot of questions. I just wanted to give you a final opportunity. There's no compulsion, but if there's anything you wanna add before we close the record, um, your final words, if you have any. I'd like for my California license to be reinstated, please. I still have a home there. I still have a home here. It should be my right to practice in the state where I gain my license. Thank you very much for listening to me and for your time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Uh, hold on for just one more second. Um, I just wanna make sure, just so the record's clear. Um, did you have any additional documents you wish to offer other than what was introduced? previously? No. Did you guys need more from the? No, no, no. I'm not trying to suggest we need more. I, I just, I always ask at the end just to make sure we didn't miss anything you might have, you might have wanted to submit. And then the oh. other is, did you have any other uh, witnesses to testify or is it just you today? Oh, it's just me. It was just supposed you. to be oh. Dr. Frankel and I, but because Understood. of the assault, he can't, couldn't come. Understood. No, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, at this point, the petition hearing is concluded. Uh, the record is closed and the case is submitted for decision. Uh, we will send a uh, written decision in the mail um, as soon as possible. Um, okay. And, and uh, wish you the very best of luck and health. Um, we can go off the record. Um, and then uh, I'm just gonna ask the court reporter to give me that information. And, and then Ms. Hayes will make sure that a copy of the form gets served on you so that if you want to order a transcript of today, um, you can do that. You'll have the information to do that, okay? Okay, thank you very right. much. Thanks. Ms. Litz, if you could just give us that information, that'd be great. Uh, the end time is 3.49. All right. And 53 pages. 53 pages. Thank you so much, Ms. Litz. And then I'll defer to uh, the board chair, Mr. Disposti, as to our break. Yes, uh, I think it's time to we'll take 10 minutes break and, and it's 3.50 right now. We can reconvene at four o'clock. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Disposito.